Welcome everyone, introduce myself. So my name is Laure, I'm legal director for um, Europe at Fair Trials. And for those who don't know us, Fair Trials is a global criminal justice watchdog based in Brussels, London and Washington DC. And our focus is on promoting fundamental rights and standards of fairness, equality and humanity in criminal justice systems. And it's a pleasure to kick off the webinar today on trial waiver systems in Europe. So I'll start with a few words to introduce the topic. Um, in 2017, Fair Trials published a report called The Disappearing Trial, which documented the growth of trial waiver systems worldwide. Effectively, in the past decades, in many European states, the majority of criminal convictions are no longer the result of a trial. States have introduced measures to bypass the trial in order to cope with overburdened criminal justice systems, court delays and ca case backlogs, all the while saving on uh, financial resources. And these different measures that have been put in place include different types. We have fast track proceedings, for instance, which are a form of accelerated trial. We also have penal orders where people are judged for what are considered to be minor criminal offenses without even appearing before court. And then we have our topic today, trial waiver systems that encourage a suspect or an accused person to admit guilt or to cooperate with authorities, waive their right to a full trial in exchange for some benefits. And while policymakers focus on the presumed efficiency benefits of these systems as solutions for authorities to manage effectively their caseload, trial waiver systems also raise fundamental questions on the social function itself of our criminal justice system. Because focusing on efficiency is inward looking. It focuses on how the system operates, but are we losing track of what the objectives of the system are? So in other words, our efficiency considerations leading criminal justice authorities and systems to focus on how to punish more and more people rather than think about why we're punishing and if we need to punish. And what does this mean for the persons concerned, the persons who agree to waive their right to a trial? We all enjoy the fundamental right to be tried by an independent and impartial court established by law. This is protected by the European Convention of Human Rights and by the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And this is a fundamental right for many important reasons. A trial serves the function of establishing the truth, or at least the judicial truth, in the sense of what an independent and impartial judge considers as representing what happened after a thorough investigation examination of the uh, evidence. A trial is also where the accused person has the chance to be heard and the chance to defend themselves, also where victims can be heard and where police and prosecutors can be held publicly accountable for any violations of rights or procedures that may have occurred during the pretrial investigative phase. This is a key function of the rule of law itself. So that's why we're very excited to be here this morning to present and discuss with you and our panelists the important questions around trial waiver systems beyond any assumed efficiency benefits. So first in a first panel, we'll be setting the scene, the broader context in which trial waiver systems fit into our systems, how they are legally framed by regional standards and what risks they present. And then in a second panel, we'll share with you our findings, findings of research we've been coordinating over the past two years to understand in what context these systems operate in Europe, whether they meet their policy objectives and whether they constitute threats for fair trial rights and the rule of law. And for this, we worked with five um, with partners across five European countries, Antigone in Italy, the Peace Institute in Slovenia, the Hungarian Helsinki Committee in Hungary, Res Publica in Albania and Kisa in Cyprus. We were also supported with research by the law firm Freshfields um, in Belgium and France. And before we start, I think it's important to mention a methodological note. The research and this event focus on trial waiver systems in the sense, um, and I'll, I'll give you the definition that we've used for our research here, in the sense of a process that's not prohibited by law, under which suspects and accused persons agree 
to acknowledge guilt and to cooperate with the investigative authority in exchange for some benefit from the state. Generally, that benefit takes the form of a lower sentence. So this means that in our research, we've not covered or included fast track procedures, penal orders, and other case disposition mechanisms that do not amount to a trial, but similar challenges are likely to arise in the context of these systems as well. Now, our findings will be published in the coming weeks, and we will share these with all of you. And I'd like to thank our partners and all those who supported the research, uh, Freshfields and the European Commission who co-funded the project, and the whole team here at Fair Trials for their terrific work. It's been a great collaborative effort, despite lockdown and travel restrictions um, across teams and countries. So thank you to everyone involved. And before um, we start our discussion with our first panel, um, we're very happy to be presenting to you a short film, um, which shows very much how uh, trial waiver systems impact um, people. So we'll start with this, with this film. Thank you. Well, fishery, uh, fishery leaves uh, basically collecting cans. He collect cans to go to uh, sell them in a recycling uh, factory. He uses like a tricycle uh, with a small engine uh, in order to make the transport. Он кам не за двет. Му на мес ден дар. А тон боже. Кужем би ус би ги. Я поздоля он кужем би его. Since there is, uh, let's say, like a, like a campaign against Roma people who are using these tricycles, the police is stopping them quite regularly and seizing these vehicles. Ja, ai on per punno sa ja. Nu kos per shema se do e kam per chef, e do dicha per chef ma to. I will pay for my family my book. This is for Kazonat, for Kanat, for Nehek, for Nehosho. The police, police, the 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 police, Edhe kjera e Paula, mu pa puna t'i rria, edhe kështu kusht do punu dhe punu. They sent him for a criminal investigation since he was driving this vehicle without a driver's license. The truth is that the vehicle was not uh, qualified uh, as a vehicle to be driven by a uh, with the driver's license because the size of the engine was very small. Fisheri was not doing anything wrong, he was not guilty because of this little technicality. So in case of a very simple and normal trial, of course, he could have been acquitted very quickly. He was threatened by the prosecutor that if this case will go to the court, then he will end up like six months in prison. In that case, he was offered by the prosecutor, a plea bargain agreement. In order to accept the guilt, the prosecutor should have said, yes, I did my job very very well, so I found a guilty person. And of course, Vichiri could have get no prison time, but a probation time. Uh, it was appointed a state-appointed lawyer uh, to defend Vichiri, but the state-appointed lawyer told him that this is the best option, you should sign this agreement. Fischeri was not able to read the agreement, he is practically illiterate, and he was not able to understand what was in the agreement, but he was forced to sign it. A trial waiver is when someone waives his or her right to have a normal trial. And you do that by either paying a certain amount of money, cooperating with the authorities, or by pleading guilty to certain offenses. And in exchange, you get a lower sentence or even no sentence at all. It's not a good system. It's not the fairest system, but it's an efficient system in order to treat cases quickly. The role of lawyers is extremely important in these uh, systems because the people who enter into those kind of systems are very vulnerable. 
they are entering into an unknown world, giving up their right to a trial. And the lawyer is the one who has to advise them and who has to help them by looking at the, the facts of the case, by assessing whether the requirements or the demands of the prosecutors are reasonable and uh, if the uh, individuals concerned give their full and complete consent to the systems. But never push people into uh, a, free, a trial waiver because of the fact that they are afraid and that they don't have the time and the money to pay for a lawyer to do the investigation in a proper uh, uh, way, but they just, out of uncertainty, enter into deals which they should never ever have entered into. So I didn't use it in the soy, but I didn't use it in the soy. E i pash pi, pa ka tani, pa... Ne se më zirë jashtë muaj, thë t'i këtë, shko kur më dojsh, kur të vetë. He still doesn't fully grasp what happened to him, and of course, and if he's not able to understand it right now, when he's in calm conditions, imagine what did he really understood when he was there, detained. There is an absolute need for stronger procedural guarantees um, for criminal defendants when they go through these trial waiver systems. We've seen that um, there is limited or no judicial oversight, there is sometimes no involvement of a lawyer or no involvement of a lawyer that has the means and resources to actually help and assist effectively the person. And that can only lead to a system that will continue failing uh, criminal defendants, whether they're innocent or guilty. Trial waiver systems are um, a symptom of an overburdened criminal justice system. And so we've seen an increase in Europe um, of the use of these systems. In Poland, for example, our research conducted in 2016 shows that over 43% of cases are resolved through trial waiver systems. In Spain, we've seen that over 45% of cases um, are resolved, again, out of court. And that is unfair. <laughs> Punka Nazis, let was men at him Bo Calbus at the Danus Bullet, the Fukare, you may make that yet. Thank you very much, Laure, for um, your introduction. Um, we will now move on to the first panel. Um, we will have a break at 11.15 between the two panels. Sorry, I should introduce myself. My name is Emmanuel de Bouvery. I'm a senior legal and policy officer at Fair Trials here in Brussels. Um, so for the first panel, we have three distinguished speakers, and I will present them as, as we go along with their presentations. Um, <clears throat> there will be a, a chance for a Q&A at the end of the three presentations, but please go ahead and um, ask your questions in the chat um, already as, as the questions come, and we will um, make sure to ask them to the panelists at the end um, of their presentations. Um, so as I said, there will be a break at 11.15 for 15 minutes, and then we'll proceed with the second panel. Um, so without further ado, um, let me introduce you to Jacqueline Hudson, who is a professor of law at Warwick Law School. Her book, The Metamorphosis of Criminal Justice, published in two 2020, shows through comparative research how modern criminal justice systems have traded fundamental 
rights principles for concerns with managerialism and efficiency. Trial waiver systems are one of the major symptoms of this trend towards a cost efficient justice. Jacqueline, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very, uh, can you hear me now okay? Great, thanks very much for that um, introduction. Um, that film I felt was a very moving film actually, it's quite hard to suddenly go into this general academic presentation when uh, having, having just seen that, it's very powerful. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm going to share my screen um, so that you can see my PowerPoint hopefully. Okay. Is that working uh, okay? Can you see that? Super, super. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do really is just um, very briefly, and I will just keep my timer here, um, just very briefly give a little bit of an overview um, around trial waivers, um, how they work in practice, what some of the issues are, um, and looking at that from a comparative point of view from um, inquisitorial and adversarial systems. So I'm not going to dwell too much specifically on, on individual jurisdictions, um, although, although I will do that a little bit. So just thinking about trial waivers in, the, in an adversarial procedure. Um, now, when we think about an adversarial procedure like England and Wales, then obviously that's essentially defined as a party led procedure. And what I mean by that is that the prosecution and defence are the ones who are responsible for the investigation and the collection and the presentation of evidence in the case. They effectively set um, the contours of the case. And that's important because we understand fair trial values within that procedure is very much rooted in party choice, in autonomy and participation. So the defendant's choice in, in um, what she does in the course of her case is very important here. And the rhetoric around trial waivers is that it's the defendant's choice to waive that right to a full trial and um, to determine to um, plead guilty. And the lawyer's role is very important there. And we saw that a little bit in the film and, and in an ideal world, um, legal representation ensures that that decision is fully informed and so on. And so that, that's a really important part of how we um, seek to understand, if you like, to justify um, those uh, guilty plea systems. And we know that there are a bunch of systemic incentives around guilty pleas, around sentence discounts, procedural rules, around disclosure of evidence, around expectations and so on. And really what underpins all of that is a desire to remove conflict, to remove the contesting of evidence. It's about getting um, an agreement um, as soon as possible in that system. And judges, prosecutors and defence lawyers are very important in oiling the wheels of this system. Simply having those rules around guilty pleas will not make that happen. And I think that's an uncomfortable um, thing to think about, perhaps for some legal actors, um, but, but we might even argue that they have a degree of complicity, I think, um, in that whole procedure. And if you think about the defendant, and, and we saw that there in that in that um, film, that we saw the, the idea of two different lawyers, the state appointed lawyer who had kind of railroaded this poor man into accepting something that he clearly had no understanding of. And then the lawyer who we saw in the film, um, who was able to show that that is not what good legal representation looks like and that nobody should be pushed into that. Um, and I think it's very difficult for a defendant as a one off walk on player to resist that professional advice and the kind of insistence that they might get um, from professional repeat players, if you like, i.e. people who are in the criminal justice system working there day in, day out um, and obviously have a, a high degree of expertise. So what's the defendant giving up? Well, it's really important to remember that the guilty plea may not have a trial, we may not have um, really interrogated the evidence in the public setting, but it's still a court finding. And that is really, really important. And we can see um, how strongly important that is, for example, um, certainly in England and Wales, it's almost impossible to overturn a guilty plea. So even when it's clear that pressure has been applied, the guilty plea is deemed as a finding of the court. It's not looked at as something that was agreed by a bunch of lawyers behind closed doors and then simply ratified by a judge and therefore um, might withstand a little bit um, more scrutiny. Um, so we know that the, the trial is the setting in which the evidence should be tested. 
Um, and we know that in an adversarial system, the pretrial system is not focused around a judicial officer. It's very much partisan. So it's important to think about how the evidence is produced, what we're looking at, what the defendant is then agreeing to, and therefore what the consequences are of not testing out that evidence. If the defendant in an adversarial system has not been to trial, that evidence has not been tested out anywhere. And so in a sense, it feels as if the work of the plea and the finding moves back a step to the pretrial. And I think the role here of the defence lawyer becomes super important because it's the, the legal representation of the defendant that provides that reassurance for the court that the defendant knows what she's doing when she accepts that guilty plea. And in that sense, the lawyer becomes a proxy for the court. The lawyer will, the sorry, the court will happily allow all of this stuff to um, simply go through often at speed and with um, little or no scrutiny because the court is effectively depending um, on the defence lawyer. It's all played out through a formal court process, which again, I think lends legitimacy to that whole um, process because the defendant is required to say words like, yes, I understand and entering a formal plea. Um, and so that again, gives that stronger appearance of understanding the charges and the plea decision. Um, so we're seeing that there's essentially, there isn't that scrutiny of evidence at court and it's being pushed back um, to that um, pre-trial work. And then again, just a note, we're all very familiar um, with the um, constraints of legal aid in terms of flat fees, in terms of low rates of fees and so on. And I think that that adds an additional um, pressure onto a lawyer's an additional constraint in terms of what they can do at that pre-trial. Um, and I think that just adds to that pressure of, of moving cases along um, really quite quickly. The other consequences, we often think about um, um, the collection of evidence and the pre-trial process happening in the shadow of the trial is a phrase that's often used and what that means is this may never go to trial but the way we behave pre-trial is in the shadow of that trial we know what the rules of evidence are we know when we question somebody we mustn't place them under duress and so on because that wouldn't then be admissible at trial and so there's a sense in which even if you don't go to trial that that possibility the promise of the trial will have an influence um, on the pre-trial procedure. Um, but I, I think that isn't the case now. And I think we see this in lots of different procedures, not just the guilty plea procedure, go right the way back to things that might be administered just at the police station even. And we see that, um, so in England and Wales, for example, suspects being cautioned, which is a formal admission of responsibility, but it means in, in exchange for that, you're cautioned and you're not prosecuted and you don't go to court. But research has shown that people often actually haven't made an admission that they're offered an accept a caution and so on. And so I think because we now, there's um, a, a sort of empirical certainty almost that most of these cases aren't going to trial, then there's a worry that that then opens the door to the prosecution of weak cases, because there's no expectation that those things um, are going to be challenged and it will be that, that evidential um, scrutiny. Um, and, and as was mentioned by law in the um, introduction, we know that these guilty pleas take place in the context of a wide range of other measures. There's trial waiver, but there's a whole bunch of other things that divert things away from the system. And this very managerial um, approach, um, and it becomes almost a form of a kind of administrative or bureaucratic justice. So that's a kind of, I know we're not going to talk about that today, but I think that's part of that wider um, context um, in which we see these trends and understand these trends. Um, and, and what that means is things like putting the prosecution to proof, um, having a, a full contested trial and so on. These just are not contemplated in most cases. And what you're seeing now, even in open court coming out of the mouths of judges, are that this is just not seen as appropriate. And when somebody has the audacity to plead not guilty, you will hear now the judge speaking directly and saying, have you, to the lawyer, have you not warned your client? You know, have you not explained the benefits and the sentence discount and so on of a guilty plea? Um, yes, I have. Or can you, we're going to adjourn, go outside and tell them again. So we're seeing these much more interventionist um, approaches from lawyers and so on. So that's a little bit of a, a kind of overview of um, within, within an adversarial process and how we might think about that. Um, but as you heard in the introduction, trial waiver systems are really kind of spreading, well have spread already. Um, and typically, again, the same rationals um, are put forward. This is about saving time, money, effort, the pain of victims and witnesses and so on. Um, you know, we, we might just pause and say there might be another way to do that. We could criminalise less, whereas we know 
that there is a trend to criminalise more. There are more and more trivial offences, offences around antisocial behaviour and so on, coming in to the, um, to the criminal justice system. Um, I'd, I'd really question this notion of efficiency. I don't think, I think it's actually about a bigger flux of cases. And if you look at the figures, it's not actually saying, okay, we had 100 cases, now we're dealing with 40 or 50 of them in an efficient way, because there was a very clear um, admission of responsibility. So that now frees up our time um, to look at these complex cases, contested cases and so on. That's not the case at all. It actually becomes a net widening effect more things get sucked into the system um, because we've actually just, you know, um, it, it's a bit like um, somebody who reduces, if you reduce the costs um, in a shop, you don't, you know, it, it's about being able to sell more. It's about being able to handle more, having a bigger influx. And, it, and it's a little bit more like that model, I think. Anyway, so I think, um, and again, in, in more inquisitorial procedures, we see those formal structures in place. Um, just in the same way as we have done in the more adversarial systems, so that this is still a court finding. So we've seen that very much so in the in the French sort of so-called guilty plea procedure, um, been challenged in the constitutional court, um, but found no, this is absolutely a finding of the court, albeit that the court can only say yes or no, um, can only ratify or reject um, the plea. So. Obviously, in an inquisitorial procedure, this is not a party led um, system. Um, the judicial function is absolutely central, it generally kind of characterizes and defines that system. Um, certainly, in theory, anyway, that judicial function before um, and after trial, uh, before and at, um, yeah, and before and at trial. Um, and so because the, the roles and responsibilities of legal actors are different there, also the role that they're playing um, in the sort of production of the guilty plea um, is also different. So what you see, um, I mean, strongly in, um, more strongly in some countries than others, but still this kind of ideology of judicial supervision and almost a fetishization of the, of the dossier as a product of this. Um, so you see this even in, in the Netherlands where you move along from saying it's prosecutorial supervision and then at one point you realise it's actually a senior police officer who for this week is, is the acting prosecutor and so on. So these, these become rather sort of tenuous structures, I think. But nonetheless, there is this sense of treating the police investigation as actually something that's characterised in some way as having some form of judicial scrutiny, whether it's an investigation or a supervised investigation. And what that does is it allows courts to attach more credibility and legitimacy um, to the evidence brought by the prosecution. In contrast to an adversarial system where it's regarded much more as a, as a partisan um, prosecution, this is the case against in inquisitorial systems, it's often understood in a, in a more neutral way, in a more public interest um, way. So I think, I think that's important in terms of when we think about um, what it is that the defence is, is agreeing to. And again, in theory, the defence seems less important because the safeguards are, are provided elsewhere. Because there is a judicial role pre-trial, the role of the defence generally um, is seen as less than in that adversarial system. Um, and that's something that French lawyers um, have spoken very strongly about, certainly in my own research, saying, you know, for example, um, when their role was introduced at the police station, saying we're just here to legitimate a, um, the police procedure. We can't do anything useful. Um, essentially, our role is ornamental. We're like a vase on the table. Um, so they were under um, no illusions um, around that. And because of this um, more diminished role that is assigned to the defence, when the defence then kind of pushes back against that and perhaps challenges um, the root of that prosecution case of the dossier, that's often um, not well received and can be even seen as an attack um, on the judiciary itself. So I just want to highlight the importance of legal actors in, in the production of the guilty plea. Those, those procedures and rules of evidence, of course, are important. Um, but they are kind of you know, brought to life, those wheels are oiled um, by um, those legal actors. So the roles, and, and it's different, I think, in different systems, and even you know, all inquisitorial systems or adversarial systems aren't the same. So we'll see that lawyers, judges, prosecutors, they'll have a slightly different status and role, um, and, and some of them will be more at the foreground um, than in other systems. 
but their role is really important and, and a lot of it is often happening behind closed doors and so it's a kind of sanitizing process so all of this kind of dirty work happens where we don't see it and then the defendant is produced at court and says yes I understand the charges and plead guilty and off we go and you don't see any of that behind the scenes work and again I think that came out quite clearly um, in the film there that we saw um, just before. So in an adversarial system, it's very much the defence lawyer providing those assurances. Um, and I think in um, a more inquisitorial system, that, that ideology around the, the dossier and the pretrial role of judicial officers and so on is also important. Um, I do think it's worth noting that they're, they're not exactly equivalent. So I think the French, I'm just going to focus on, on France for one moment here, because I think the French um, example shows this quite well. So I think there isn't the same pressure. Um, so in England and Wales, people will be negotiating and bargaining often right up to and on the day of trial and so on. The French system, the guilty plea procedure is, is not a negotiation and a pressure. It's something if there is if there is an admission, then it goes through to the guilty plea. But if there isn't, then the prosecutor is generally fairly content for it just to go to an ordinary trial. Why is that? It's because the, there is not such a huge difference there between making an admission and not making an admission um, in the um, French system. And that's because the trial is less um, central, the centre of gravity is much more at the um, pre-trial. Um, and as I say, the, an admission from the defendant is just like another piece of evidence, if you like. So you'll, you'll see a case where the defendant denies something, but actually the conviction will still happen really quite rapidly. So I think we just need to be careful that we don't overgeneralize that all of these systems are um, really similar. On the other hand, what is similar is the way that that impacts backwards into the criminal justice process. For example, in France, the one thing that you will see across criminal defense lawyers, even those who are um, duty lawyers, who might generally be family lawyers or property lawyers, but they're on the duty to list a scheme and so on, the one thing they all know to say is, hey, you might want to make an admission now because then you can benefit um, from the guilty plea procedure. So it does have that kind of back, you know, that sort of reverse impact um, as well as going forward. So I think, and unsurprisingly, uh, as in life in general, there's a, there's a big gap um, between rhetoric um, and practice. Um, and defence lawyers in England and Wales, what we see um, is happening in the, rather than them providing, rather than them ensuring that it's an informed and a voluntary choice, is often actively persuading the defendant to plead guilty. Um, and it's very, you know, it's, it's not difficult to do that. This is the expert and you'll find typically them telling their clients, you won't be believed, it's a tough bench, you know, this is the best way to have some certainty and so on. Um, and they can kind of square that in their mind with their own professional duties because there's a sense of kind of almost moral uncertainty in the evidence does look really strong. They probably will be convicted. So if I persuade my clients to plead guilty, that probably is a better outcome for them. But what they haven't done is, is, is sat down then and interrogated the evidence and really seen if they um, could make a good stab of um, actually contesting the trial. Again, legal aid rates in the background there operating as a, a bit of a constraint there. Um, judicial supervision by the prosecutor, as I said, there's, there's, that is apparently to will, would lend this kind of public interest centred ideology, this truth seeking ideology and so on. Um, but my own research and that of others has found that actually supervision is very file based, retrospective. It's about the form and the outcome of the inquiry, not how that evidence is produced. And there's a very strong ideology of guilt where you're finding um, prosecuting um, judicial officers actually very much aligning themselves with um, the police. So again, that, th those two assurances, what I'm saying is I don't think that they um, really work. Um, so the, the prosecutor is, is assuming the truth of the police account, the court is um, assuming the truth of the account that comes to them um, in the dossier. Um, and again, um, this is not the same in all systems, but in somewhere like France, because the prosecutor, the trial judge, the investigating judge, and so on, they're all magistrats, they're all part of the same professional group. Um, there's something that, that French commentators have talked about, a sort of judicial corporatism, where it actually becomes very difficult to challenge one another, so there isn't that system of checks and balances. So these are all things that just undermine this idea that we can rely on this guilty plea because of what's gone before it, because it actually has, often hasn't happened, obviously, in the way that we might um, understand. 
And then just to, to mention the role of defence lawyers, that, that whilst they are assigned a much smaller role within inquisitorial procedure because of this idea that the, the judge is doing a, a lot of that work, it is becoming increasingly important um, in countries like France. But the worry is um, that it's becoming important in ways that legitimate a procedure, that we can tick a box saying the Article 6 fair trial rights are there, you've had a lawyer, but it's a lawyer that we're not actually allowing to do her job. Um, and so that becomes, you know, this idea of defendants being credited with a benefit that they never really had. And as I say, certainly French lawyers have, have pushed back against that and have resisted the fact that they feel that they're being um, brought in to kind of um, legitimate um, the procedure. Um, so final slide, you know, can, can we say still that the defendant has a right to a fair trial um, when we know that the rules and the procedures and often the behaviours and the roles of legal actors are really shaped around ensuring an admission. When we know that the contested trial is seen not only um, as exceptional, but is often seen as inappropriate, um, and there's a, there's a real pushback from the courts that this is not what we do, you need to resolve it um, in some other way. And the guilty plea has that hallmark um, of a legal finding of guilt by the court, a conviction just in the same way that you would have a conviction um, after a contested trial, that there's apparently all the same fair trial rights and so on in place in the procedures. But actually, once you scratch at the surface, it falls away. And, we can, and, and I think we can't be confident about defendants making informed and voluntary choices in really understanding um, actually what they've um, entered a plea to. And the evidence isn't being tested at any point in the process. It's not that it's being agreed and tested and we can be sure of it before trial and when it comes to court. That's not what's happening. It feels like more of a conveyor belt um, where towards admissions that happen both before um, and at court. And often in these guilty plea procedures, the court's powers are quite limited. Um, sometimes they limit, the, they limit their self-limiting, um, but also they're limited in law as well. So, for example, the guilty plea procedure in France, the, the court can simply accept or reject. They can't say, well, hold on, can we just check this bit or that bit? And that feels a bigger, a bigger leap in France because we're used to the judge taking the centre stage and actually really choreographing um, that, that whole procedure. Um, and again, as we saw in that film there, that, that defendants are often, these are often the most vulnerable people. I think anybody is, defendant, is, is vulnerable as a defendant, any of us, you know, even as, as lawyers um, who were um, being prosecuted at court and so on, um, would feel vulnerable in that system. But often people with, um, as we saw in that film, um, who may have other, other types of vulnerabilities, which just heighten that. And so my final kind of question to you really is, you know, is this really an authentic conviction and sentence, given that we have this appearance, we have a guilty plea and a sentence at court, but when we look behind that, have we had anything that resembles the processes of fair trial? And if we haven't, what does that say about this mass of convictions um, um, that has been highlighted several times already that we're now convicting more people out of court than in court? Okay. Um, thanks very much. And I have, I am also doing my shameless bit of publicity because Emmanuel had mentioned that my, my book had been, when we chatted, and she was buttering me up to come along, said this, that the book had been important. So um, if, if that's of any interest to you and you want to know more, um, then that's the, the book that was referenced um, at the outset. Thanks, Emmanuel. Apologies for speaking quickly, everybody as well. Thank you, Jacqueline. Perhaps you can stop sharing your screen. Is this working? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, Jacqueline, for brilliantly setting the scene. Um, I and you ended up on this aspect of consent. Can people, considering their um, vulnerability when they're caught up in the criminal justice system, and considering that all criminal justice actors are in effect uh, co opted to influence the direction of the case towards, um, I mean, out of courts and away from a full blown uh, trial, how real? is a person's ability to voluntarily 
and and knowingly consent to a trial waiver system. And this is exactly what Rebecca Helm um, will talk to us about. Rebecca Helm is the director is the director of the evidence based justice lab at the University of Exeter. She holds a PhD in law and developmental psychology. Rebecca conducts research using quantitative methodology and behavioral biology to examine and evaluate the operation of legal regulation in practice. A large part of her research focuses on the failure of legal regulations to address the psychological and social pressures that can lead innocent people to plead guilty. Rebecca, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen too, so just give me a second. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I've been studying trial waiver systems um, now for almost 10 years, so I'm really excited to be here today and to be part of this discussion about, um, about what we kind of do with our understanding um, of those systems now. Um, one thing that I've always felt really um, concerned about when looking at trial waiver systems is whether people in these systems are genuinely consenting to be convicted or whether they're actually being pressured or even coerced to give up their right to a fair trial. I think traditionally people always thought that guilty pleas were an admission against the person's interest, right? Um, you're doing something which isn't really good for you because you committed a crime and you think it's the right thing to do, something like that. But as these kind of complex um, incentivized trial waiver systems that we're talking about today um, have built up, that's all changed. And actually there's a lot of really good reasons to plead guilty, um, even when you're innocent. But we've continued to justify these systems on the basis of consent. So consent's doing a lot of heavy lifting here. But in practice, I think there's a big, um, difference from the rhetoric that we're talking about, like Jacqueline said. Um, these things might look consensual, but actually there's a really good case uh, for saying that they're not. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about just briefly today. And I wanna start off by looking at the European Court of Human Rights. Um, what do they think about trial waiver systems? What do they think about the importance of consent? Um, in some ways, that's a difficult question to answer. The case law on this at the moment, unfortunately, is incredibly limited. Um, but essentially what they've said is that yes, pleading guilty involves the waiver of a right to a fair trial. It must be consensual. And their case law gives us some idea, although a very limited idea, about what they think consent looks like in this context. The first case which looks at this issue is a case called De Vere versus Belgium in 1980. And this is actually a case in the civil law context. Mr. De Vere owned a shop where he sold meat and he was accused of selling that meat at a price which was too low in violation of a ministerial decree. Mr. De Vere then faces the choice. He can essentially admit what he did, accept wrongdoing and pay a fine or he has to face the closure of his shop pending um, a determination of wrongdoing at trial. Unsurprisingly, Mr. De Vere decides to pay this fine to keep his shop open, but he later argues that this was a violation of his right to a fair trial. And the court actually agrees with him. They say that the fact that he had to close his shop, the fact that he risked having to lay off employees, the fact that he would have suffered significant economic loss awaiting a trial actually meant that his decision to admit guilt, to waive his right to a trial, was tainted by constraint and accordingly there had been a breach of Article 6. We also see this kind of dialogue and discussion about ideas of consent, um, a lack of constraint, in case law more broadly looking at the waiver of rights guaranteed by the convention. And this is one of those cases, DH versus the Czech Republic in 2007, 
That case actually involves rights to education of children from Roma communities. But the court says that the waiver of any right guaranteed by the convention must be established on the basis of informed consent and without constraint. Now there's only one case where they actually look explicitly at guilty pleas, so trial waivers in the criminal context, and that's a case from 2014 called Natsplish Ville versus Georgia. That case involved a man accused of company law offenses. Um, essentially, he accepted a plea bargain, um, which enabled him to avoid an almost certain custodial sentence at trial. The chance of conviction at trial in Georgia, at least at that time, was something like 98%. He knew if he went to trial, he would most likely be convicted. Um, he also knew he would face a custodial sentence. Um, at that time, he was detained in very poor conditions in custody. And he said he was left with no choice but to plead guilty. He needed to get out of those conditions. He couldn't face that custodial sentence. But in that case, the court didn't believe that his decision to waive his fair trial rights was tainted by constraint. In fact, they said that his acceptance of the plea bargain was undoubtedly a conscious and voluntary decision. So what makes that different from De Vere? Why are the court um, deciding that there um, was consent in Nats, Nats Blishvili, um, there wasn't in De Vere? Um, and what can this tell us about how the European court are interpreting this concept of constraint? I think for me, the answer is that it doesn't tell us a great deal. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, the court in Nats Blishvili seem to interpret consent very narrowly. They're not exactly clear how they're interpreting the concept. And I think it leaves a lot of unanswered questions. And what we as kind of lawyers, as legal professionals, need to think about is what we can learn from that case, but also what we think voluntariness, what we think consent should really look like in this context. So first, I think we need to consider what actually needs to be voluntary. Um, is this actually the acceptance of the specific bargain that you're offered, or is it the waiver of trial rights more generally? In the De Vere case, they focus on the waiver of trial rights. In that splish Philly, they seem to be moving towards talking about the explicit bargain. But of course, once you've been offered a bargain like the one in that splish Philly, which involves almost certainly getting a custodial sentence versus immediate freedom, the choice um, to accept freedom rather than that sentence um, is one that many people will make voluntarily, right? we'll probably actively want to avoid custody. We don't need anyone to tell us or apply illegal force to cause us to accept that freedom over the custodial sentence. But the problem here is that actually having been offered that choice in the first place is coercive in itself because it dictates the decision to waive trial rights more broadly. And I think we need to take really seriously this idea that we can actually manipulate people's autonomy through changing the choices that they face. I wanted to give a kind of unrelated example here to contextualize this. Um, I have a very young daughter, right? And she really doesn't always like going to school. Um, sometimes I actually have to persuade her to go to school. Um, I still like her to feel like she's made the choice to go in I like her to feel that she has autonomy, but actually I know that she has to go to school. I know that's what's going to happen. So if she doesn't want to go, I might offer her incentives to go. Um, I might offer her candy, for example. I might make staying at home less attractive. I might say I'm working, it's going to be boring, she should go. And unsurprisingly, she's never ended up not going to school, right? Um, but the appearance of choice that she has here is relatively illusory. She is choosing, she ends up agreeing to go, but actually I've dictated her behavior by manipulating those choices that she faces to cause her to act a certain way. 
this is relatively unproblematic, I hope at least when we're talking about parent and a child, uh, particularly because it's relatively widely accepted psychologically that children don't actually have the capacity for full autonomy yet. But I think it's much more problematic when we're in the trial waiver context here. As Jacqueline noted, there are many reasons that the state actually benefits from a defendant waiving the right to a fair trial. It saves time, it saves resources. More broadly, it allows it to prosecute the number of cases that it wants to. And in these decisions, the state, the party that benefits from the defendant waiving the right to a fair trial, is setting or at least has control of the parameters that are actually influencing that choice of the defendant. The state has the capability to dictate the behavior of defendants by manipulating the choices that they face. And I think that's quite dangerous and that's why probably protection from bodies like the European Court of Human Rights is very helpful in this context. One important question that's still unanswered is what actually is voluntary in this context, right? Um, we see the court using a lot of related terminology, um, things being voluntary, things being consensual, defendant autonomy. Actually, when we look at these concepts, which are important psycho-legal and philosophical concepts, it's not really clear what they mean. Psychologically and philosophically, actually this concept of full autonomy is a really unrealistic hypothetical ideal. We can strive towards it, but our decisions are never fully autonomous. They're constrained by a huge range of influences from around us. So the more meaningful question that we need to be engaging in, um, with in this area, rather than just saying, um, this is voluntary, this isn't voluntary, is what is voluntary? What level of autonomy do we need to justify convictions without a trial? So what do I think we should be looking for in this context? What do I think voluntary should look like? Um, I've made some slightly more technical arguments about this in written work, but I essentially think we really need to be taking this question of autonomy seriously and asking whether incentives to plead guilty promote autonomy. Do they give the defendant a choice that they can freely make? Or do they manipulate autonomy by essentially dictating many defendants' choice by the options that, present, that are presented to them? And I think maybe that's what the natsflish billy case comes down to. It's not necessarily that we think a huge discrepancy between plea and trial is always going um, to be permissible. But in that case, Mr. Natsflesh Ville um, was a very wealthy businessman. He was almost certain to be convicted at trial. His team actually approached the prosecution and suggested this, and he got an offer which really looked like a great deal to most people um, looking at it from the outside. But what we saw from that video at the beginning is that's not really the typical case where people are feeling coerced to waive their rights to a fair trial. And I think there's much stronger cases. I think those cases come up very often, probably very often amongst people who don't necessarily have the resources to take their case up to the European Court of Human Rights. What I wanted to talk about briefly is three examples that I've seen from my work um, that I'd like everyone to consider as we go through today in the European context, where potentially um, rights can be undermined, um, consent is undermined. And some of these examples are from England and Wales, from the United States, but I think they're examples which could equally apply in European jurisdictions. The first example is where there's a large discrepancy between the outcome from pleading guilty and the outcome if convicted at trial. And this is in some ways similar to the Natsflish Villa case. But like I said, the people who it traditionally happens to don't really look like Mr. Natsflish Villa. This is um, a quote from someone who I surveyed, a practitioner talking about their client's experience in this area. They said, the problem is, if they run a trial and lose, they'll be looking at prison. But if they plead guilty, probably a community order. 
that makes a massive difference between someone keeping their job or not. And that's what we saw in the example um, in the video at the start of today. These, um, this picture here is of some similar cases in England and Wales. They were sub postmasters many of whom were essentially coerced into pleading guilty by the threat of a jail sentence. Um, they ended up pleading guilty. It's now become clear that they weren't guilty. Actually, the evidence against them was generated by a computer system that we now know to be faulty. When you speak to them about why they pleaded guilty despite thinking they were innocent, they say they didn't have a choice. They could not afford to go to jail. And there was this threat of jail hanging over them if they wanted to go to trial that they could avoid by pleading guilty. It wasn't that they thought they would be convicted. It wasn't that they were willing to accept those convictions. It was that they really didn't think they had a choice. They had families, they needed um, an income, they had mortgages, um, they couldn't go to jail. They didn't feel like they had an option. Another type of case is where people are remanded in custody um, pending a trial and can actually be um, released from custody if they're willing to plead guilty, but will have to sit in custody for a longer period if they want to exercise their right to a fair trial. So here's another quote kind of encapsulating this problem. It's not uncommon for a prisoner who has been on remand to find themselves in a position where they are likely to be released immediately if they plead guilty rather than face conviction at trial. Um, lawyers, at least in England and Wales, really disagree about how often this occurs. One thing that we do know is that the risk of it is getting more severe um, as a result of backlogs resulting from the coronavirus pandemic. People are being held on remand longer, this risk becomes more real. This is actually an example from the United States, but it's something that we see a lot in England and Wales, and I expect you'll see in Europe too. Um, it's a woman called Irma Faye Stewart. She was arrested based on the word of a confidential informant as part of a drug sweep. She was being held on remand and was told that if she was willing to plead guilty, she could be released, she could essentially um, be released because she'd served her sentence, right? She'd been on remand um, for long enough that her sentence, if she pleaded guilty, would be served. Um, if she wanted to exercise her right to a free trial, on the other hand, she was going to have to sit in prison, um, sit on remand for longer. Um, she was a single mother. She wasn't very well. Her family were in really precarious um, financial situations, and she desperately needed to be released. She needed to get back to her kids. Um, she needed to regain the financial stability that she'd lost by being held on remand. So she ends up pleading guilty on that basis. Um, actually, after she pled guilty, it came to light that the evidence against all of those, the group that were um, arrested with her, was very unreliable. Everyone who could afford to sit in custody pending trial ended up being released without charge. But she um, obviously retained her conviction since she had supposedly voluntarily accepted that conviction by admitting guilt. The last one is the time and cost of trial. And here's a quote um, from the survey encapsulating that one. I've had clients that are insistent that they haven't committed an offence, but they've said they can't afford to go to trial in terms of time or money. Um, and I think this is a big problem um, in England and Wales um, because of our um, legal aid system, difficulties with the legal aid system that Jacqueline mentioned. Perhaps this is important in Europe too. Um, people really can't afford to go to trial. They might lose their job if they have to take the time off associated with trial. They can't pay a lawyer. They can't pay for the evidence that they think they need to call. Um, and essentially, pleading guilty is the way out, right? It's the only realistic um, alternative. It's the only alternative to trial. And lawyers will often kind of push this. They'll say, yeah, we also agree that this is a good idea for you. So there are all these situations in which incentives to plead guilty aren't promoting defendant autonomy. Defendants really feel that their choice is being, um, their decision is being dictated by this choice that they're having to face. 
Um, I wanted to briefly end by talking about what I think we can do about this. Um, I think first we really have to engage with this question of what is voluntary and then what isn't voluntary enough, right? It might have some semblance of being voluntary. There might be the presence of some choice. That choice might not have been dictated by an illegal threat, but we need more from consent in this context. Consent is doing a huge amount of legwork here. We need to engage with it in a meaningful way. And we do in other contexts, which I think is really interesting. So considering the employment context, when we're looking at consent, the European court has really engaged with this idea that economic constraint can undermine consent. Um, they do in De Vere, and I really hope that if a case um, like this, um, where economic constraint has really limited defendant action um, comes up, we're gonna see a different outcome from what we saw in that splish Billy. Once we know what we want voluntariness to look like, we need to be introducing safeguards um, to say, how can we ensure that decisions are actually voluntary in that sense? Um, and there are ways that we can do this. We can make sure that the reductions if you plead guilty compared to the sentence at trial are much more modest than they sometimes are now. We can ensure consistent release on bail um, for people who would be released if they pleaded guilty. Um, we can take the, um, the need um, to avoid imposing a custodial sentence more seriously. If people, if no sentence other than custody is really appropriate for someone, if they go to trial, is it really appropriate if they plead guilty? And we need robust judicial monitoring in this area. And I think in some ways, um, that's one of the big things that we're missing um, at the moment. Like I said, the state really benefits from people waiving their right to a fair trial. They're also setting the parameters or at least have control of the parameters in plea decision-making. Um, there needs to be much more oversight of that to recognize the people benefiting from trial waiver are the ones who are in some ways controlling the decision where the trial is waived. Um, I think we also need to continue to collect data um, we've done a lot of this um, in the United States, in England and Wales, but it would be great to see some more data on European um, systems. Guilty pleas aren't admissions against people's own interests, so we need to know what they are, why are they being made, and is that normatively appropriate? And um, some of the ways we've collected data, we've used experimental work, we've interviewed defendants, we've interviewed lawyers to really get a picture of what's going on in practice and that potential gap between rhetoric and practice uh, that Jacqueline mentioned earlier. Um, that's everything that I wanted to say, I think. Um, but thank you for listening. Um, thank you to Fair Trials. I'm really excited about this webinar and about this project more generally. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, Thank you. This was really enlightening um, and useful for us, and I hope uh, interesting for everyone. Um, and I think in order to keep some time for the Q&A at the end, um, I'll immediately um, pass the, the, the microphone to Alejandro Gámez Selma, who is a criminal defense lawyer in Spain and a member of Fair Trials Leap Network. He's a partner at the law firm Red Juridica, uh, that is a progressive social oriented law firm based in Madrid. Alejandro, um, I think this is what um, you will tell us about what, as a defense lawyer, you have first first-hand experience of how these trial waiver systems operate. Um, you have, I think, observed whether people do indeed have a free choice to waive their right to trial and, and um, in what context can a lawyer advise otherwise. Um, so please, uh, Alejandro, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you for offering me this opportunity because uh, plea bargaining uh, discussions in Spain are reduced to inner circles and we don't, we have had not yet a, like a profound inner thoughtful discussion about it. So Jacqueline and Rebecca's uh, intervention has been really, really enlight enlightening 
for us. So I try to land what they have said to the Spanish specific situation. So let me also please share my, share my slides. Okay, are you seeing are you seeing my slides right now? No, now we can see your face. Okay. You so, were just for two seconds. Yes. <laughs> there they are. Uh, what's happening right now? Um, okay. So if share your screen, it worked a minute yeah, ago. Was, yeah, we can see we can see the slides. Now we can see you the slides. slides right now? Okay, so let's begin. So first of all, uh, in a very brief introduction, I'd say that trial waiver systems in Spain, they work in mainly three, three ways. In ordinary proceedings, you can have plea bargaining at any time of the proceeding through a specific protocol of plea bargaining where you, as a defense lawyer, you call or you send a mail to the public prosecutor and you have a reunion, an uh, intimate reunion without the defendant, or you can agree on it just on the verge of the trial, like five minutes before. It's actually very common that there are many, many trials forcing uh, scheduled in the, in the court. And five minutes before the official of the court tells you, do you wanna come in and have a, a little meeting with the public prosecutor in order to see if there's a possibility to plea bargain. And there's a high percentage of, of cases which are solved in this way. Also, we have the fast judging proceedings, which are like specialized for a, a special kind of, of crimes, which are like easy to investigate in, in the case and um, in the case that you want to plea bargain, the incentive or the, bene the benefit that the defendant obtains is that the all penalties are decreased by one third. We, this is very important by what we will see laterly because it will it can mean in many many times the difference between entering or obtaining the suspension of prison also there's the the last one the acceptance by decree procedure which is uh, has an identical use so i i won't enter into it uh, referring to facts and statistics please let me say that there's a complete obscurity or a lack of transparency or maybe i would say lack of interest in uh, public institutions in knowing how the plea bargaining or trial waiver systems uh, operate in Spain and what their impact is. So if there are no public figures about it, let alone uh, critical studies from university or from any other collective analyzing it. So all I'm going to say is mainly based on the public prosecutor annual reports and on the Judiciary Council annual reports, but uh, be clear, please let's be clear that uh, the facts are, the statistics are disaggregated and that they don't cover all the proceedings or they, from year to year, they change the information they give. So let's begin uh, first by the uh, condemning sentences by plea bargaining among all the condemning sentences in fast judging proceedings, which Alejandro? have passed from... Uh, yes. I just want to make sure you um, you know you haven't changed slides yet. I don't know if that's if if you were meaning to change to move on to the next slide or not. No, I think I'm the correct one right now. Can we're you still see the condemning the sentences? No, we're only seeing the first one. Really? Ah, yes, I have changed like four times. What's happening? Mm. Let me see. So it, try again sharing your screen and I think you can um, mm -hmm. Okay. Are yes, I right think now? I think that's perfect. I think now we're on the right track. Yeah. Emmanuel, are you watching the types of we're, trial waiver systems in Spain? Exactly. We are. Okay. Sorry. This this was the slide that I just presented before the three types of, of proceedings, which I already talked about. So let's pass to the statistics. Here you can see the evolution of plea bargaining sentences over 
the total of condemning sentences from 2013 to 2020. You can see that it has maintained like a level around 79% to 73 among the 100%. Please keep in mind that uh, condemning sentences in fast judge proceedings uh, am paramount to uh, maybe a 90% of total sentences. So this in the total sentences ratio is even higher, but at least you can see that the, the, the ratio is really, really high. In plea bargaining sentences before the criminal judge, criminal judge, I'm simplifying it to, to say that these are the trials for ordinary crimes, not serious crimes. It has risen from 47% to 64% in the last seven years. The same has passed for serious crimes, which are tried before the criminal court where plea bargaining has increased from 34% in 2013 to 59% in 2020. In gender violence related crimes, the, the plea bargaining sentences have increased from roughly 43% in 2013 to a roughly 60% in 2020. In labor related crimes, because this special prosecution area or unit does want to uh, publish data, which I think should be a uh, preceptory for all special prosecutions, but this is the only one which does it. The plea bargaining sentences have, have also increased from a 67% to a 79% last year. In juvenile jurisdiction, the, the ratio is much more or less the same in the last year from 72% to 72%. And those are all the stats we have. I mean, we cannot disaggregate nor make any other critics because we don't, we don't have the, the figures to do it. What we know for sure is that uh, in 2019, almost a little bit more than 50% of the condemning sentence of the, of the trials, sorry, of the proceedings, more than 50% of the proceedings were ended by plea bargaining. This means that if the trial, these trial waiver systems weren't implemented, the Spanish judicial system would collapse for sure, for sure. So there's obviously an, um, an interest in the judiciary system and in the, in the government to encourage this type of trial waiver systems. What is specific from the Spanish systems? They are based on addition to accusation. I mean, the public prosecution presents the writing of accusation presents the facts and you have to adhere to them. You cannot challenge them or at, law, at least not based on, le on the law. Maybe you can, you can <clears throat> change the facts in order to add mitigating circumstances or to change the civil liabilities or to reduce penalties, but you cannot challenge the facts. Legal assistance is mandatory in all cases safe car traffic related crimes where it's optional, but in, in real life, also uh, this kind, these people accused of safe car, of car traffic related crimes uh, do dispose of legal assistance of uh, state appointed lawyers. And uh, also important, the request for prisons cannot be over six years in order to have a plea bargaining. If not, it's prohibited by our law. Also, if you if the defendant plea bargain, plea bargain, plea bargains and access uh, to this kind of sentences, they renounce to the appeal. The judicial supervision of plea bargaining is mainly a myth. I mean, there's in the in our legal system, in the in the books, they should challenge it, they should oversee it, but in the in the end, they don't do it. They just Sorry, have to change it. This one. In the end, they don't they don't oversee uh, the judicial bargaining. They have they are uh, linked by the court, and they their main goal is to control the informed consent of the accused person. But in the end, they don't really do it. So if if the judge were to ask the defendant, are you adhering to the accusation? 
because you don't want to enter into prison or because you recognize that you are guilty. If they ask that, like 80% of the times, they would have the answer that, no, I don't want to enter into prison. So the, the case should be, the plea bargain should be avoided and there should be a, a trial. But of course, uh, courts don't do that. So in the end, uh, the plea bargain is, is accepted and the informed consent is not truly overseen. So why is this, are these plea bargaining systems uh, increasing so much? First of all, because there's extremely reduced rate of judges and prosecutors per inhabitant, we have less than half of the rate of judges and prosecutors than other countries like France or Germany, for example. We have bad paid and bad trained state appointed lawyers, for example, for a regular, for an ordinary crime, an state appointed lawyer get a media rate of 200 euros per case, which includes from going to the police station, challenge all the resolutions, draft all the writings, draft the writing of defense and going to trial. So of course this encourages lawyers not to go to trial. Another important uh, circumstance is what we call the, the two years blackmail, which is, which is the legal provision that prison sentence under two years uh, may be suspended if the defendant is a first doer. This uh, provokes that many, many first doers uh, between the risk of going to jail or, go, or having a suspended uh, prison, they, they recognize the, the guiltiness. Is what uh, we, we think is a change of risk. Even if many times, if you were to go to, to trial, you could obtain, even if declared guilty, a, a, a reduced sentence, a sentence below two years prison. But the security, the knowing of security that you are not going to enter into prison is probably the biggest milestone or is the biggest reason why uh, lots of people uh, agree to, to plea bargain in Spain. Also for, for migrant people, prison sentences over one year are obliged by law to be substituted by expulsion from territory, which also is a blackmail for people who have social roots in, in Spain they can be legal or irregularly uh, in Spain, but if, uh, if they have social roots, the expulsion from territory and the prohibition to enter in the following 10 years also works as, a, as, a, as an incentive to plead guilty, even if they are not uh, guilty of the crime. Also, the suspension of rights to drive over two years implies the loss of driving license, which implies that you gotta make the exam again and you have to pay for making the exam. So this encourages also people to plead guilty in cases relating car, car driving uh, crimes. That's why Judiciary Council has promoted uh, increasing all the plea bargaining uh, procedures in Spain in the last years, including in the draft of the criminal procedure law, which will, well, is right now uh, being um, drafted but is foreseen to be approved in the following years. In this case, if it is approved like that, the trial waiver systems will expand even more. So just in my, in our, in my association, in my daily experience, life at courts, what these plea bargaining, which discriminations do, are, do they associated? First of all, clearly with poverty, Besides the, let's say, typical principle that um, criminal code punishes poverty, in this case is very, very clear because state appointed lawyers, because of their lack of time, their lack of payment, their lack of interest, they promote uh, getting um, a plea bargaining because the lack of money uh, impedes or avoids having access to another uh, uh, private evidence like reports. Because I would say that uh, impoverished people or like, uh, I don't know how to say, people in the lowest uh, classes, they don't have a very big faith 
on the presumption of innocence. So they are more ma they are much more uh, disposed to accept guiltiness in order to have their reduced sentence. And uh, because um, public prosecutors do blackmail or do encourage more harshly in this kind of cases than in big cases. So in the end, uh, when you ask your defendant many times, do you want to go to trial? I cannot guarantee you not to enter into prison, but I can guarantee you that I will do my best. Many times they say, no, my main interest right now, because I have a job, because I have a family, is not to enter uh, in prison. So let's plea bargain. Of course, as, as Jacqueline and Rebecca have said before, many times, many state appointed lawyers and private lawyers also, in order just to maximize their benefits, they encourage the, the plea bargaining. For migrants, as I have said be before, uh, the necessity to avoid expulsion when they have social rules, when they have a work here, when they have a family, when they have their friends, when they have like cut almost all links with their countries, they make their they make the plea bargaining uh, necessary in order to to avoid expulsion from the country. And in the case of juveniles, I would say that uh, is the highest ratio of. Um, plea bargaining and it's due because juveniles are much more impressionable by all the theater that a court uh, implies and also and is completely connected I, I, I mean I'm sure is because juvenile jurisdiction is the only one where public prosecutors are the one who investigate not the because in Spain all in all the other cases we have uh, investigative judges and not public prosecutors in charge of the investigation and they are for sure much much more harsh on interrogators inter interrogations of defendants and on exercising the decision of which um, evidence admit and which evidence reject in order to follow the investigation so thank you very much. That's all I had to say. And um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Alejandro. It's, um, I think you gave a, a very striking illustration of how um, it ends up being in the interest of all criminal justice actors to push cases away from trial. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating. You explained that judges would not want to investigate, or, I mean, to inquire into the actual free consent of someone, um, because that would probably mean that the, the plea bargain is not valid, and that would probably mean that um, court overload uh, would increase, and that's not in, in, in the interest of judges. So it's, um, I think this, this goes back to what Jacqueline was, was saying at the very beginning, that all actors are um, accomplices in this system uh, that is ultimately failing criminal defendants um, who bear the burden of these cost-efficient um, criminal justice policies. Um, we have five minutes and I see that the chat has been um, quite alive. Um, perhaps perhaps uh, Rebecca or Jacqueline, you want to comment on the... Uh, I see you've discussed legal aid uh, lawyers and and the right to appeal. Uh, so if you want to just say a few words about that and what you've seen in your research. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that, um, so what I put in the chat was that I think legal aid is important and it acts as an additional constraint and it exacerbates um, and it sends a real clear message about what's expected from lawyers. So as Alejandro has just said, you know, two, 200 euros gosh, to do everything from the police station to all the preparation to the trial. I mean, that's sending a message that we, you know, either we expect you to work for free or we expect you to do very, very little. Um, so it, it's undoubtedly an important factor, but I was kind of flagging up some earlier research that I did at the beginning of my career, which was a big, big study of criminal defence lawyers. And it's interesting because that was at a time when in England and Wales, legal aid rates were at their highest. Um, and there was still very much that push towards um, um, pushing defendants towards guilty pleas and making admissions and so on. So I think there are wider issues around occupational cultures, around training of lawyers. 
and lawyers in England and Wales, their training has changed as a result of some of that early research that we did to get a, a more adversarial perspective and to ensure, particularly at the police station, that lawyers um, appreciated the difference that they could make and so on. Um, so all lawyers are not the same and there are some lawyers who are very adversarial and robust in their defence of clients, but there are many lawyers um, who are not. So I think the, the issues are a, are a little bit more complicated. And, and the appeal system, which is um, something that Rebecca flagged up as well in the chat, I think is really interesting. I've just been looking at some appeal cases where, where judges are just, they're just not interested in all the pressures and everything that have been placed on defendants. And they just fall back on saying, um, you know, that the, um, the um, appellant received appropriate advice from legal counsel. Um, and what that means is, you know, that for the prosecutor or the defense lawyer, and so long as that was appropriate, nobody did anything wrong. They're just not interested in looking behind it, even when there are lots of red flags about the fact this is not a reliable conviction. And, yeah, and think, finally, just Alejandro, thank you. You're, very sadly, a lot of what you said sounded really familiar. Um, so that was that was a bit depressing in a way that, that many of the same things that we've seen elsewhere, you're, you're identifying as happening in Spain. But I'd, I'd love to know more about that over time. Thank you. Well, you're coming. Thank you. <laughs> I think one of the things which is really um, problematic, particularly when we're talking about appeals, is this focus that we're putting on the lawyers as if there's this idea that a good defense lawyer can protect someone from ever pleading guilty when they're innocent. Um, one of the big problems is in the system that we have, sometimes it's quite possibly the sensible thing for an innocent person to do to plead guilty, right? Um, because they can't afford to go to trial and that's a possibility. Um, sorry, they can't afford to go to prison and that's a possibility, for example, because they need to get off remand, right? So what's a lawyer meant to do? They're meant to say, I want you to risk, I want you to risk going to prison because I think you're innocent. And the lawyer can't always do that. So I think we can't, um, the system pins too much on those lawyers and, and there's issues with the representation too, but sometimes the best lawyer in the world could solve these problems. Um, in England, I don't know if you have such a thing in Spain, but in England, we have a criminal cases review commission um, and where people don't have the right to appeal, they can still go to that body um, and that body can investigate whether they think the conviction is um, a legitimate one. And if not, then they can refer the case to the Court of Appeal um, directly. Um, it's typically used when people have exhausted all of their rights to appeal. Um, but in cases, for example, where, where they don't have a right to appeal for whatever reason, um, that's kind of a bit of a fallback mechanism, which, um, which is sometimes helpful, I understand, in England and Wales, um, or at least it should be. If I could just leap in there, because I've done quite a lot of research with the Criminal Cases Review Commission, um, and they are very, very, very reluctant to refer a guilty plea case, and their policies have changed over time. So they have successfully um, referred cases on guilty pleas, successfully referred them and convictions have been overturned, but they've also at points had policies where they think actually there are no reviewable grounds because it was a guilty plea. So it's it's been very problematic. So um, I, I wouldn't look to the CCRC, I don't think, for um, for a remedy there. Yeah, I've been I've been working with them a bit recently, and I tend to have like a bit more confidence than some people because I do think they're really trying, um, particularly um, with guilty pleas in children, because um, they're recognizing some of the issues that I think Alejandro um, mentioned, uh, you know, about high rates of pleas in children. Um, so I think they're trying and maybe I have over, over optimistic confidence, um, but um, we'll see. <laughs> I would say that in Spain, there's no such a criminal cases review institution. So we don't have that opportunity. And I also like to, to make one reflection or one thought is that the difference many times between pleading guilty or not is of course uh, in, on the shoulders of the defense lawyer, but it's based also on the um, kind of evidence of burden. I mean, many times if you have documents which, uh, which might make you um, aware of the possibilities of being declared guilty or any other kind of evidence, of course, it's natural to, to maybe sometimes assess the, the client uh, to plead guilty if they let's say the incentives are, are good enough. Problem arises when the only evidence of burden is testimonial, is like witnesses, especially when they are like police testimonies or something like that, where uh, the um, irrational or illogical factors or the prejudicial factors of the judge 
uh, come into come into force. It's like it's a criteria that it's been not studied, or at least I have not studied. But for sure, I wouldn't say the same to my clients in case it was the word of my client against the worst of a policeman or the worst of my client against the word of another person. And in that case, you can also make a criteria between the socioeconomical condition of the other part of the other person. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, to your point, uh, Alejandro, um, and I think this was raised by by all of you, um, clearly, the trial waiver systems have a, um, a disproportionate impact uh, or discriminate against uh, a certain groups. Um, and we've, we've mentioned migrants, undocumented people, and, um, and low-income uh, criminal defendants. Um, and I think that's also something that um, we should have in mind. Obviously, this works for the for the criminal the way the criminal justice system operates generally, but this is all the more striking when the procedural rights guarantees and the judicial oversight is not there as a safety net to to protect these groups. Um, I think we have to stop now, unfortunately, and I would have loved to continue the conversation, but we're already three minutes into the break in principle. Thank you so much to all of you, all the speakers that was really fascinating and wonderful and I look forward to continuing this conversation um, elsewhere. Thank you so much. Um, we will turn off the cameras and microphones for uh, 15 minutes and we'll resume um, at 11.34. Um, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hi everyone. Uh, I think we're going to resume now since we don't have much time um, for this next panel, which is um, um, going to be a presentation by uh, all of our partners and by Fair Trials of domestic research findings and um, or comparative or regional uh, research findings. Um, so the, fir the first panel really sets the scene and the context in which these trial waiver systems operate. And now um, our partners will um, go into what they have highlighted in their own specific jurisdictions as specific problems and, and in particular procedural rights uh, challenges um, that are particularly important um, in the context of trial waiver systems. Um, I will introduce each um, partner speaker as, as, they, um, uh, as they present. Um, so uh, one key aspect that was identified, and this was also mentioned by the previous speakers, is the, the lack of effective assistance by a lawyer. And sometimes the lack of assistance at all um, by lawyers in some systems. And um, I will first give the floor to Katerina Vuko from the Mirovny Institute in Slovenia uh, to um, explain what she has observed in her jurisdiction. Katerina, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, hello from me. Um, as Emanuela said, I'm Katerina Wutko from the Peace Institute, the Slovenian partner to the project. And I will just share first with you the, um, the, my presentation. There, you should be seeing it now. Okay, thank you. So I would like to present to you the issues identified um, concerning the right to, the law, to a lawyer in Slovenia's trial waiver systems, and maybe some concerns also identified with discriminatory practices that we found. But first, to give you some context, um, I would, um, to give you some context about uh, uh, the criminal, about the trial waiver systems in Slovenia, I would like to say that we have two forms. One is admission of guilt agreement, and the other is free trial hearing. And both were introduced to the Slovenian criminal justice system in 2011. So if I start with the admission of guilt agreement, this is a mechanism 
that provides for the possibility that the state prosecutor and the defendant reach an agreement on the conditions under the which under which the defendant will plead guilty in court. And to reach this agreement, they will engage in formal negotiations. And if these are successful, they will conclude this agreement that will be signed by both parties in writing. Um, they will, there will be a description of the criminal offense, um, the admission of guilt, and also what the content of the agreement is. And usually that will be uh, the penalty or the manner of executing the penalty. Very rarely, they will also agree uh, on the cost of the uh, criminal proceedings and sometimes fulfillment of some other tasks. And almost never, I think, they will agree that the prosecutor will abandon uh, some criminal prosecution against uh, concerning some other criminal offenses. And then the state prosecutor will then submit this agreement to the court um, that needs to confirm whether this agreement is within the bounds of the law and then accepts or reject it. And for this entire procedure, um, the law prescribes a mandatory lawyer, meaning that the defendant must be represented by one during the nego negotiations, and if successful, do during also the entire court procedure until the finality of the judgment. Um, and that means that the um, defendant may hire a lawyer, him or herself, but if they don't do so, then the court will appoint one for them, and that lawyer will be state paid. And in our case file analysis, in our research, the 70% of our sample, the defendants in negotiations had the state paid lawyer, meaning that they didn't hire one themselves. Then I go to the other uh, trial waiver system, which is the pretrial hearing. Uh, this is an intermediary phase of the proceedings after the indictment becomes final and before the main hearing is scheduled. And in this hearing, um, the admission of guilt agreement will be reviewed by the court. But uh, this is also uh, this hearing is also a trial waiver system in itself, because this is the phase where the defendant will plead guilty or not guilty in court. And if the defendant pleads guilty, he or she will waive the right to a full trial, and the trial will go to sentencing. Of course, if the court accepts this. Um, Plea, guilty plea if, uh, if the court deems that all the elements are there to accept the guilty plea. So there won't be a full trial, it will go straight to sentencing. Um, and at this preliminary, preliminary hearing, contrary to the negotiations um, and admission of guilt agreement, having a lawyer is not mandatory. It is only mandatory if there are maybe some other circumstances under the law which require mandatory representation. For instance, if uh, there is punishment for the, this particular criminal offense of eight years of imprisonment or more. Um, and in our case file analysis, in our sample, only 48% of defendants who pled guilty in the pretrial hearing um, not, were not represented by a lawyer. I mean, 48% uh, of the defendants who pled guilty were not represented. Um, and only 46 of those who had a lawyer hired one themselves, which means that the others that had a lawyer, they had a lawyer appointed to them. Um, so this was um, because of these other circumstances, they were they had the right to a mandatory lawyer and, and the court appointed one to them. So the bottom line, bottom line is that there is a very high percentage of defenders, defendants in Slovenian criminal justice system who are not represented by a lawyer in proceedings, proceedings against them. And this is also confirmed um, with, other, with, other, uh, with other research, previous research. Um, this is even more relevant uh, because, uh, because in practice, the state prosecutors and the defendants often engage in so-called informal negotiations, which take place in the court hallways right before the pretrial hearing starts. Uh, they make an oral agreement that the defendant will plead guilty and that the state prosecutor will suggest, suggest a specified sentence. The court will then be bound by such a proposal, meaning that they may not impose a lighter, they, they may impose a lighter sentence than the one negotiated or proposed by the, by the uh, prosecutor, but not a harsher sentence. Um, at this stage, the law does not really foresee such negotiate, negotiations between the defendant 
and the state prosecutor, and it is really contrary to the basic principles of the criminal procedure and to the law. Uh, and for these informal negotiations, there are no prescribed procedural safeguards, and such as mandatory lawyer, as I already mentioned. And this means that many of many or even the majority of the defendants who will engage in these informal negotiations will not receive any legal help when making such a deal with the prosecutor. Now, we do not have any reliable data on or any hard data on how many informal agreements are really made between the defendants and the prosecutors, but re reports really indicate that there are many, even the official reports of the state prosecution. Um, in fact, while it was, it, it was envisaged by the legislature that the admission of guilt agreements will be predominant in practice, it turned out quite the contrary. Uh, prosecutors often find that these negotiation processes are too time consuming and too bureaucratic or too formalistic, and they feel that they can really reach the same result if they go to these informal negotiations right before the pretrial hearing starts. Um, and also the statistics that we do have show that annually there are only three to five percent of all defendants who conclude this admission of guilt agreements. And on the other hand, between 26 or 28 defendants annually plead guilty before courts in this hearings, and um, they had potentially informally negotiated with the prosecutor. So this is uh, the these are the findings that concern the, the right to a lawyer. And finally, I would just like to quickly mention some, some of the uh, discriminatory practices that we came across uh, in our research. Now, firstly, there is, of course, no reliable uh, research or data on discriminatory practices in Slovenia. But in our interviews, lawyer man, the lawyers mentioned that the defendants who do not have the means to hire a lawyer are more vulnerable. And uh, particularly in this context that I was talking about before the, this informal negotiations with the state prosecutors. And on the, on the other hand, the state prosecutors will be more interested in formally negotiating and concluding agreements with the defendants who are suspected of white collar crimes, for instance, and who have a better economic starting point to negotiate, for instance, a criminal fine. So in a way, it's more worthwhile to negotiate with them. And lastly, and very importantly, um, foreign nationals seem to be a very vulnerable group in these trial waiver systems, particularly when they are not uh, residents of the country. And uh, according to one lawyer that we interviewed, the, um, the this discrimination, come, discrimination comes from the fact that pretrial hearing is uh, pretrial det detention is always ordered against them, and this is a wider problem in our system. Uh, it is justified that they don't have any ties or any assets in the country, and it will be very difficult to get them to engage in the criminal proceedings later on. So they just systemically put them in pretrial detention and uh, often unnecessarily. Um, and this is a huge motivation for them to conclude agreements with the prosecution as they wish to really shorten the time in the pretrial detention and just move on the process as quickly as possible. Um, I will stop here and um, I will thank you for your attention and uh, give back uh, the floor to Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, I think this presentation really echoes a lot of the things that were said as well in the first panel. I'd like to invite uh, Dorian um, to from Respublica in Albania, um, whom you've also seen in the in the movie at the beginning of this um, seminar webinar. Um, to address the, the issue of equality of arms in um, trial waiver systems um, in Albania. Dorian, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I think, yes. Uh, so I am Dorian Matlia, uh, practicing lawyer and the executive director of Respublica, the regional partner of this project for Albania. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation since I, I find it, I, I prefer to focus more on the direct communication. 
So I'm just giving you a short review of the Albanian legal order and then to go into details. So in the Albanian legal order, there are currently uh, four uh, basic procedures uh, aiming at shortening the criminal proceeding and one a special one which is uh, focused more on the minors. Uh, uh, this is uh, these are provided by the criminal procedure code or the code of criminal justice for children for for juveniles. Uh, two of them, uh, namely the direct trial and the penal order, are uh, can be initiated only by the prosecutor and it's under his discretion. And the other three, the abbreviated trial, the judgment upon agreement, and the diversion from the criminal prosecution for minors, which happens under the, the, the judgment upon agreement also, this requires the definite consent and can be considered as pure trial waiver procedure. Uh, this, uh, two of these uh, mechanisms are introduced in the last uh, four years with the, the main uh, justice reform happened in Albania. Uh, the abbreviated trials are initiated exclusively by the defendant uh, before the pre preliminary hearing judge and do not require any admission of guilt. Uh, and judgments upon agreement can be proposed by the prosecutor and require the defendant uh, confession. Uh, these constitute, these two constitute by far the most prevalent trial waiver mechanism in, in Albanian legal order especially the, the first one which makes uh, more than 80 percent of cases of the entire criminal cases uh, procedures in, in, in the courts of Albania. Uh, we may say that one particular problem that we identified with the abbreviated trials, which are the most cases, uh, the climate at the chambers of the judge holding the preliminary hearing following, following the conclusion of the criminal investigation by the prosecutors is rather tense. Often the preliminary hearing judge will open the discussion by asking the defendant whether they want an abbreviated trial. Uh, the lawyers claim that uh, a negative answer to that question, together with requests for gathering the additional evidence or not gathered by the prosecutor, often elicits a visible frown from the judge by the judge, who is more like uh, that, more like that, not to re uh, not to reject any request for additional evidence, noting that the case file is complete and reiterate, reiterate the question again uh, whether the defendant wants to request an abbreviated trial or not. At this point, the defendant, that this is the problematic part, has to make an almost split second decision. So either the defendant requests an abbreviated trial or answers that he or she prefers a trial under the ordinary procedure. In, in this last uh, letter case, the defendant therefore has both lost the possibility of reducing the one third of the sentence, of the eventual sentence, and has not managed to secure the gathering of additional evidence at the time which is, which is uh, an important consideration if we consider the, that this information is time, is time sensitive. Um, we should say that the defendant who requests a trial under the ordinary procedure can hardly have any reason to believe that stand any fair chance of being acquitted by the court. Uh, as we have noted also in our, uh, in our material and will be published, uh, uh, we have noted that in most of the cases, like 80% of the cases that we have seen use the abbreviated trial, uh, the acquittal rate in the, especially in Tirana's court, which is the main city and has the one third of the Albanian population is rather low, is at, at around 2.9, it's even decreasing 2.9% or lower the acquittal rate. And uh, there is no evidence as to the percentage of the first instance judgments upheld on overturn on appeal. Still, anecdotal evidence suggests that this is very low. Uh, so this is uh, something which uh, makes uh, some somehow forced decision by the defendants uh, that they don't have any, any trust that they can get any acquittal under, uh, under these low rates. Uh, then there is the problem of the uh, of the access to file, which uh, lawyers uh, have claimed that in trial waiver procedure they face almost the same structural problems that all criminal lawyers face, such as namely the fact that often prosecutors' offices do not allow lower lawyers timely access to the file to the case file, or do not allow access on various pretexts, thus forcing the lawyers either to study the case on the spot or merely get the photos with, on, with their phones and of the most relevant documents of the case file. And so let's talk a little bit for the equality of arms uh, in this state of proceedings. Uh, first and foremost,
foremost. I have to say that the Albanian system is a mixed system between inquis inquisitorial and the adversarial systems. The elements that saturate the system as an inquisitorial one create an unequal balance of powers, making the one party strong, which is the prosecutor, and the other party, the defendant, vulnerable. The lawyers don't have power to investigate in Albania, to collect crucial ev evidences like uh, locations, uh, metadata, or CCTV footages, which are very prevalent in these days. Uh, mostly lawyers can only bring a witness to testify, but that is nothing compared to the powers of a huge machinery of the prosecutor's office with lots of resources and more rights, of course. Uh, the inequality of rights to investigate as a systemic problem, combined also with the resources unbalanced, especially for the defendants which are from the poor and marginalized groups, makes a very huge difference in terms of uh, equality. So during the, the preliminary investigation phase and before being called to decide on whether they request a trial waiver, the defendants are afforded the formal criminal procedural rights foreseen under the criminal procedural code. Thus following the conclusion of the criminal investigation, the defendant will be informed accordingly and should be afforded a period of 10 days, which they can submit additional information or request and some follow-up investigation measures are, are undertaken or asked to be questions. Any decision by the prosecutor to turn down a request uh, to collect additional information should be reasoned, but, but that rare, rarely happens and the decision cannot be challenged before court, thus making these memos of the lawyers an ineffective remedy and, and the file will contain basically only incriminating evidences collected by the prosecutor. And concerning the judgments of an agreement, the court will not review the case, but merely ensure that the basic qualification criteria for endorsing the judgment upon agreement are met. Set criteria are both procedural, like whether the defendant concern, consent is informed or whether uh, he or she understands the term of, of the agreement, and can be also substantive, sub substantive uh, whether the evidence included in the case file could not serve as prima facie basis of the defendant's conviction or whether the punishment was inappropriate in light of the nature of the offense or the personality of the defendant. Uh, but the, perhaps, let's say, the biggest shortcoming in these proceedings, especially the judgment of upon agreements, is the possible role of the defense counsel during the investigation phase of the proceedings. It would seem that the role of the lawyer is merely to observe the prosecutor uh, is doing his or her job properly, rather than working towards establishing the innocence of the client. As, a, and as I said earlier, the prosecutors, however, tend to focus more on collecting incriminating evidences rather than exculpatory ones. Uh, so in a way to, to challenge or to recommend to make a better system, a fairer system, uh, to, work, to, to ensure, let's say, a better brigade for all, uh, we may say that uh, we recommend, to call, first of all, to collect and disseminate more comprehensive statistics regarding trial waivers. One of the biggest problems and challenges that we've, we have faced when carrying out the research on, this, uh, on trial waivers in Albania uh, was the absence of high quality statistics. Without these statistics, it's very, very difficult to prove an unfair state of play and to advocate them amending legislation or taking other appropriate measures. Uh, then, of course, uh, we recommend, uh, secondly, to we recommend that should, uh, the judgments of our, upon agreement should be made more transparent and based on more uh, responsible criteria. Like, for example, we, we recommend that the High prosecutor, Prosecutorial Council, which is, let's say, the top uh, authority in the field, adopts the, the guidelines setting out a range of discounts that are permissible, as well as providing the departure from these lower and upper thresholds are possible, subject to, however, to the prosecu prosecutors providing convincing grounds uh, as to why such a departure is called for in a particular case. Equally importantly, the guidelines should draw the prosecutor attention to the imperative need to not make any offer for a judgment or agreement before collecting enough material that attests prima facie the, the defendant's culpability. Moreover, the guidelines should draw the prosecutor attention to the need to respond to reasoned requests for collection of additional evidence. Uh, we should also see to, uh, the, and can use and can make, uh, can take advantage of existing foreign good practices and implement measures toward uh, and establishing a more level playing field, more level played field uh, between uh, defendants and their lawyers and prosecutors and judges. So we, as a Respublica, we find particularly pro problematic the imbalance of power between various actors. Uh, and uh, we 
see that a more comprehensive approach is needed, one that calls for a substantial amendment of the criminal procedural code. Fortunately, the legislation, the legislation have not to look far to, to, for potential good practices in light of the numerous elements that have been borrowed directly from the Italian criminal justice system. It is important to undertake an in-depth comparative study of the two systems with a view to identify which further elements can be introduced in the Albanian legal order. Respublica considered it, it is very crucial in this respect that the scope of power of the Defense Council can be widened so that the lawyer can take a more active part in the criminal investigation, act as a counterweight to the prosecutor, and ensure the exculpatory and mitigating evidence is collected and presented to the court in due time. And another last element that we may recommend is also to use strategic litigation uh, as, a, as a side, let's say, uh, tool. So lawyers can employ strategic litigation tactics to, to make full use of the procedural means already av available under Albanian law, or to invoke comparative law-based arguments with a view to establish uh, the non-existence of adequate safeguards in proceedings taking place under the abbreviated trial procedure, especially in Albanian law, and then address counter arguments based on the restrictive approach of trial waivers adopted by the European Court of Human Rights. And we have, for this, we have prepared a short document with domestic guidelines for lawyers to help them thinking out of the box uh, of the usual practice and start challenging the system to improve it. And I think that I have already crossed the time limits. Uh, so I rest my case and leave the floor immediately. So thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dorian. Yes, um, I made an apparition for, for that purpose. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to um, now uh, ask Federica Briocci from Antigone in Italy to present uh, her findings. Thank you, Federica. Hello, hi, hi everyone. And uh, thank you very much uh, for um, being here uh, with, uh, with us today. Um, in our research in Italy, we mainly focused on two trial waivers uh, that are basically the plea bargain and the abbreviated judgment. Um, the plea bargain is, um, is a special procedure that is aimed at um, closing the criminal case without a trial, uh, just like many other uh, criminal justice systems. Um, the, the agreement on the sentence can be, um, can be suggested, can be proposed uh, by the defendant, the, the lawyer or the public prosecutor. Um, and then they basically they try to find an agreement on a on a specific sentence uh, the sentence proposed can be either an alternative to detention or a pecuniary penalty uh, or a custodial sentence and the requirement is that um, when the calculation of the reduction uh, by uh, up to one third is done that it doesn't have to exceed uh, five years of imprisonment um, so so, of course, not all crimes uh, can fall under this uh, specific procedure. Um, the role of the judge in this case is the, is the one of the verification, basically, on the admissibility of the request, of this request. And the judge has to verify uh, some specific things, for example, um, if the um, if the penalty is uh, adequate for uh, the criminal fact, and then the judge can decide um, whether to accept or uh, to reject the proposal, uh, but he can never modify the agreement itself. Uh, one particular thing is that the the our and the, our our um, penal code doesn't really require the defendant to explicitly acknowledge the responsibility uh, or to plead guilty at the moment uh, of the um, uh, of the request for a plea bargain. Uh, but there are actually some different jurisprudential approaches to the meaning of the plea bargain in terms of guilt. 
um, this basically means that for one approach, the, the plea bargain implies an admission of guilt, uh, while for other approaches, um, it, it, for example, it, there is a conviction, but it doesn't uh, have any effect in terms of guilt or doesn't have effects in the civil or administrative proceedings. So this is something that is not clear and that in some cases have play, has played a very critical role um, for some of the defendants. Um, I will come now shortly to the abbreviated judgment, which uh, basically, um, it shortens the resolution of the trial because um, uh, basically the defendant and their lawyer uh, can, uh, can ask and request that the trial be defined at the preliminary hearing. This means um, that the judge will actually be called to establish either a, a, a guilty uh, verdict or an acquittal on the basis on the of the evidence that is presented only at the preliminary hearing. There is also a possibility for the integration of uh, some evidence, uh, but it has to fall. I mean, the judge has to decide whether this integration that is requested uh, falls uh, within the, the 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 ratio of the shortened procedure. Um, if if a defendant asks for too many uh, pieces of evidence to be collected and acquired by the judge, then the judge might even reject. Um, the, the, the this procedure and then go with a normal trial. Um, during the interviews with lawyers, um, ah, sorry, one one last thing on this issue. Um, as I said, the sentence can be either of acquittal or conviction, and the judge determines the sentence. Um, at first, it mm, takes basically into account all the circumstances and sets a. Um, uh, an amount if it is like uh, if it is a, a detention a conviction and then this sentence is reduced by one third ex officio um, and what came out of the interviews with lawyers is that they said that basically they advise their clients to avail themselves uh, of this procedure um, if they think that there, uh, that there is not enough proof for a guilty sentence. And so basically at this time, it would be possible to, to have an acquittal. Or if the proof against their, their client is so overwhelming that they basically prefer to at least benefit from a reduction of sentence. Uh, one of the issues that was noted for both these, um, uh, for both these uh, trial waiver systems is that um, in, in the Italian penal system, some penalties are becoming increasingly higher for some crimes. And so actually many of the crimes uh, could fall out of these procedures and, and defendants could not benefit uh, from them. Uh, there are, coming to more of a side of a procedural rights, there are some systematic issues from the point of view of procedural rights that surely impact uh, the possibility of the defendant to make an informed choice on whether to um, ask for uh, these kind of procedures or whether to accept the um, maybe the advice of, of the lawyer on this issue. Uh, so, first of all, the right to a lawyer cannot be waived in Italy, and uh, this is valid also for a trial waiver. Um, procedures. So at least this is one this is one thing that is always present. But as we know, when it comes to ex-official lawyers, there are some there might be some problems because um, when it comes to uh, knowing the client, accesses the client, and the time that lawyers have to prepare and the confidentiality of meetings, there are some issues. Uh, there are basically, um, there is one specific case scenario when there's a new criminal case, um, which basically entails the, um, uh, when the, um, when the defendant uh, is arrested basically in, fra in flagrante delicto and then 
um, is immediately taken uh, for maybe a fast track trial uh, that can be requested directly by the prosecutor when um, when there is uh, uh, when when a defendant is taken in flagrante delicto. So this and at that point, this is. This is a very chaotic phase. It has been described by lawyers. Um, there is very little time uh, to meet a new client, if it is, of course, an ex-official lawyer. If it is, um, if it is a, a trusted lawyer, it is different because maybe they have known each other, maybe even for in previous cases. Um, and so they meet only a few minutes before the validation hearing and the prosecutor might be hand, able to hand the case file over to the lawyer only five minutes before the beginning of the validation hearing. Um, and the lawyer has very little time to, to, to study it. And if there is a, um, uh, if, if there is a foreign national, uh, also the issue of interpretation services can be uh, a challenge because they are often des described as uh, poor or um, not enough, uh, not available, or there are several difficulties that are faced. And all these shortcomings uh, coming to an end, uh, they are not new, They're, uh, but they have a specific impact on trial waiver systems because um, it, it can be very difficult for the uh, defendant, for the accused person to really understand the consequences of, um, of their choices um, by not being able to uh, speak with the lawyer or the lawyer not understanding fully what uh, the circumstances of the case are. They can also, they could also be advising um, the, their client, maybe not in the best way. So, and uh, this is why they, uh, this is why the, the respect of procedural rights is very important, especially in uh, these, during these mechanisms. And this will be all. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Federica. Um, and indeed, of course, um, the, as you say, the trial waiver system context is a, Catalysts or uh, or increases um, uh, difficulties with with respect to procedural rights that of course exist in in the wider context of criminal um, justice in Europe. Um, I'd like to give the floor to Nora Novozadek. Sorry, Nora, um, uh, who is a senior legal officer at the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, um, and Nora will uh, go over. Um, uh, judicial controls and judicial oversight of trial waiver systems in Hungary. Nora, you have the floor. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, so I would like to start by briefly presenting the trial waiver forms currently in place in Hungary. Um, these were introduced in 2018. And um, as you will see, the Hungarian legislature very much relied on the Slovenian example when, when drafting the rules. So the first trial waiver form is um, the settlement to plead guilty. Um, this is concluded uh, between the defendant and the prosecution in the investigative phase of the criminal procedure. So before the prosecution files the bill of indictment. So this is a formal agreement uh, with various elements to be negotiated, but the facts of the case and the legal classification are not subject to negotiation. Um, in the end, the settlement shall be approved by the court, uh, but it is important to note that the court may only review the legality of the settlement, but it cannot change its contents, for example. Um, the other trial waiver form uh, is the confession at the preparatory session of the court. Uh, this takes place after the indictment, but before the main hearing. Um, and in this trial waiver form, uh, the prosecutor has the possibility to make a so-called sentencing motion. Uh, this is a motion uh, for the exact punishment acceptable for the prosecution, would the defendant plead guilty and waive their right to a trial. Um, but making such a motion is not obligatory for the prosecution, uh, so the defendant can waive their right to a trial even if no such sentencing motion was submitted. 
Uh, finally, the court shall decide on accepting the confession or not. And uh, if it accepts the confession, it cannot impose a harsher sentence than the one in the prosecution sentencing motion. So um, as far as the practice is concerned, uh, what we see from the statistical data is that uh, the settlement to plead guilty, so the first form I presented is uh, heavily underused. Um, in contrast to that, a significant proportion of defendants choose the second form, so they choose to confess at the preparatory session uh, of the court instead uh, of uh, going for a full trial. And um, the two aspects of trial waivers in Hungary and of our research uh, I will speak about today in a bit more detail are firstly the ineffective judicial control of consent, and secondly, the connection of trial waiver systems to defendants' vulnerabilities and to general structural deficiencies um, in terms of their procedure rights as prescribed by the EU Roma directives. So first about the role of the court. Um, the court has to examine both when it comes to the settlement to plead guilty and both when it comes to the confession at the preparatory session, uh, whether the defendant understood the nature of the settlement or the confession and whether they understood the consequences uh, of their approval by the court. Uh, whether there is uh, no reasonable doubt as to the sanity of the defendant and the voluntariness of the confession, and that the defendant's guilty plea is clear and it is supported by the case files. Um, to that end, uh, judges shall hear the defendants, uh, but the law does not give any real guidance as to the depths of this questioning. And so what our research showed was that the judicial practice varies greatly in this regard, in, in uh, what uh, these questionings cover. Uh, so according to, to your research results, it often happens that the judge will only ask the accused a yes or no question on whether they admit their guilt, and that's it. Uh, this obviously does not allow judges to reach a well-founded decision about whether the settlement or the confession can be accepted or not, whether it complies with the legal requirements of, of being uh, voluntary uh, and clear, etc. Uh, so the solutions lie mostly within the courts here, um, and so they should ensure and facilitate through issuing professional guidelines and training, for example, that the practice is uniform and that the questioning of the defendants is of sufficient scope and content, uh, and that the courts examine and merit the fulfillment of the conditions for approving a settlement and accepting a confession as provided for in the law. But uh, we are of the view that attorneys should also contribute uh, to this by making use of the possibilities flowing from the procedure of position um, in order to ensure or contribute that the judicial control is in fact effective. Um, as far as the defendant's position is concerned, um, the Hungarian research shows um, in line with the international experiences that the dangers inherent in the trial waiver uh, forms uh, will mostly make the situation of those defendants more difficult who are already more vulnerable than the average in a criminal procedure. So the various risks, um, including pressure from the authorities, um, are greater for defendants with uh, poor advocacy skills, indigent defendants or defendants without a defense counsel. And uh, for example, when it comes to the second trial favor reform, so the confession and the preparatory session of the court, uh, having a defense counsel is not required. Um, finally, uh, the trial waiver systems in Hungary are undermined by general structural deficiencies in terms of defendants' procedural rights as guaranteed by EU roadmap directives. Examples include here, and this is not a full list, that uh, the information on procedure rights as provided by the police in the investigative phase is not always sufficient and it is not provided in a clear and accessible language in general. And of course, then the same applies to the information given to the defendants about the possibility, nature and consequences of a settlement. Um, also, there are no real guarantees to receive quality interpretation in the criminal procedures. Um, and for example, only a restricted part of the case file is translated by the state for the defendants. So all these can easily undermine, uh, in our view, the chances of a defendant to make a truly informed decision uh, to enter into a settlement process or to confess. So in other words, uh, trial waiver forms will amplify existing structural shortcomings within the criminal justice system and their effects on defendants. 
And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nori. Right on time. Um, amazing. Thank you. Um, so I now would like to give the floor to Nicoletta Sharalem B. Do, sorry, again, Nicoletta, I never pronounced your surnames, um, who is an advocate at uh, Kisa uh, in Cyprus. Um, Cyprus is um, a very different system from uh, all of the other ones. It's based on common law and, um, and the trial waiver systems are, the trial waiver system is completely informal. Uh, Nicoletta, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel, and thank you everybody for a very interesting uh, uh, webinar actually on this issue. Um, yes, I will try to give a, a very short description of the system as followed in Cyprus, which we call a common law system. So there is no, uh, there is not any formal uh, uh, formalized trial waiver system in the sense that uh, under common law rules, uh, any person uh, accused of, for an offense has the right at any point of the proceedings. So it doesn't have to be right at the beginning, at any point uh, to plea uh, guilty. Uh, and the only exchange, uh, if someone pleads guilty in the end, uh, depending also at what at what stage of the procedure uh, they are going to be plead guilty, uh, is ex the exchange is that uh, they get lower sentence. Uh, so this is the main uh, principle around any sort of trial waiver system uh, we have. Uh, even though uh, you cannot always uh, be sure about the sentencing and how low this would be, because the judge never. Uh, interferes or the judge never participates uh, in any uh, informal negotiations that they may be, be between the lawyer of, uh, of the person uh, accused of an offense and the prosecution. Uh, the judge is completely neutral in that respect and the only, the, the only responsibility and obligation of the judge uh, in this context is to make sure that from the facts of the case, uh, it is clear that uh, an offense uh, was committed. Uh, so this is an obligation that every judge has uh, to make sure when they have a guilty plea. Um, and this is very important, but very often this is not, um, especially when it comes to minor offenses uh, or not, um, uh, it's not always the case that the judge will actually read properly the facts and make sure that uh, an offense was committed before accepting the, the guilty plea. Uh, so in, in such a system that is not formal at all, uh, and uh, basically the person accused is very um, relies and uh, is very much dependent on the advice uh, uh, he or she is going to have from their lawyer um, because uh, th there is not any other safeguard in the procedure. Uh, the, the court will not actually review uh, any type of agreement for a guilty plea. Uh, and uh, one has also has to be aware that uh, if, um, if accepted a guilty plea, uh, uh, you cannot appeal uh, the conviction unless you can prove uh, that uh, the facts of the case did not reveal any offense, actually. So, it's very difficult because you lose all, all your rights also of appeal. Therefore, the position of the lawyer is critical. Uh, and this is where we have a lot of shortcomings because procedural rights and guarantees are not fully observed in Cyprus. Uh, they are not fully observed uh, in the context uh, also of the pre-court procedure at the, at the time of the investigation uh, from the uh, police authorities. It's not, always, um, uh, it's not always the case that a lawyer is there uh, right from the beginning of the investigation and right from the beginning of the um, uh, testimonies given uh, by the person concerned. 
Um, it is not, uh, we don't have any recordings uh, of these procedures at the police station when in the context of the investigation. Uh, so it's only what you have in terms of uh, various templates and uh, documents that the police officers uh, have to uh, normally uh, write down what happened in the context of the investigation. But you don't have anything really to prove for sure whether your procedural rights guarantee were observed from the very beginning of an investigation of an offense until the very end and until you get to reach the court. Um, so in that context, the risk of, um, of, of pressure uh, of uh, arbitrary procedures that are not regulated in any manner and that are not um, um, always um, uh, make sure that all the safeguards are in place for a, a person to plead guilty, uh, it's, it is very risky and it is very often that uh, the right to fair trial is waived without uh, really um, ensuring that uh, this is in accordance with fair trial rights. Um, the, the other problem is that because you can uh, change your guilty plea or not guilty, guilty plea to a guilty plea in the context of the whole procedure before the court. So it could be even at the stage of the hearing, the pressure on persons accused of uh, is, is always there. So you don't have a stage in the procedure that, okay, you took a decision whether to plead guilty or not guilty and then you follow that decision until the end and you don't need to have the pressure of deciding otherwise if you see that the case is going well or not well or whatever. So uh, public prosecutors are normally putting pressure at various stages of the proceedings, depending on the evidence, of course, they have uh, for a change uh, of, of a person's uh, plea. Uh, and of course, because of all these shortcomings, uh, as it was mentioned before uh, by various uh, other speakers, uh, this uh, comes out to be to affect much more vulnerable uh, persons, uh, such as migrants, uh, such as uh, persons of low uh, income, uh, or persons that they live in the margins of society for uh, various reasons, uh, because they rely mainly on legal aid. Legal aid, just as in other countries, is paid very, very uh, low. Uh, they don't. They don't. They are not paid according to the work actually performed. Uh, so it's much easier for a lawyer uh, to get paid uh, the two hundred or three hundred euro. Uh, under legal aid uh, by uh, convincing the client to plead guilty. Also in cases of migrants, uh, another is important aspect is the, is the role of the translators because very often migrants appear before court without even having a lawyer because the translator told them that uh, it's better if you admit so that you take a sentence, a short sentence, and, uh, uh, and then uh, you can uh, get on with it. And you don't need a lawyer, really. I mean, there is no point to have a lawyer. But this, it, it has proved actually rec very recently, we had a lot of cases of, um, of refugees uh, trying to travel with false documents, uh, which normally up to now, the sentencing, when you admitted to the offense, I mean, trying to travel with travel, uh, false documents in another EU member state to seek asylum. Uh, up to now, the sentencing, when you admitted, was about two, three months uh, maximum if you plead guilty immediately and the court didn't have to go through the whole procedure. Uh, with recent cases, and because we had so many cases of people trying to travel with false documents because they want to leave the country, because the situation in Cyprus is intolerable, uh, we got sentencing of 10 months, 12 months for using false documents in order to get out of Cyprus. Just because people uh, admitted guilty, even though they had a defense, they admitted guilty in the majority of the cases without a lawyer and on the advice of, uh, of, of translators. 
uh, we had pregnant women who admitted guilty and uh, they were sentenced to 10 or 12 months in prison, even though this is in violation of the law because pregnant women cannot be jailed. So we, ha we have so many shortcomings that nobody is actually observing uh, whether the admission of guilt uh, is correct or not. Uh, nobody's observing whether that person had a lawyer or not. And nobody's observing whether the procedural uh, guarantees have been properly applied uh, in a case. And this happens by particularly in, uh, uh, with vulnerable uh, groups. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, I think I'm on time, <laughs> Manuel, or did I exceed? <laughs> You're perfect. <laughs> okay, so I will leave it at that and we can discuss further this different common law type of system uh, we follow in Cyprus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicoletta. And I think one of the aspects you raised just now, to what extent uh, there in fact is um, a sentence discount a benefit for the person who agrees to plead guilty. Uh, and we've seen in the research in, in Cyprus, but in other countries as well, that it looks like prosecutors um, offer sentences that are higher than what the court would uh, impose um, generally. This is, this is also uh, a reason uh, to advocate for more data collection, more research, impact assessments of these systems to, to ensure that they're actually not entirely failing um, accused persons caught up in the criminal justice system. I will now give the floor to my colleague, uh, Nathalie van de Velde, who will uh, um, very briefly, unfortunately, present um, uh, the regional findings um, uh, which will be published in our reports in the coming weeks. Um, Nathalie, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, so I'm Nathalie van de Velde. I'm an assistant legal and policy officer at Fair Trials. Uh, and thank you very much to all of you for joining us today. I will now share my screen. So um, I will now wrap up all of our speakers from the first and second uh, panel brilliant interventions uh, while trying to putting it into perspective with our own uh, regional research findings. Uh, first, I wanted to say that, of course, all systems are uh, very different from one country to another, and some of our findings are more striking uh, in, a, in some of the countries. But we will present now the recur recurring trends that we have observed around uh, systemic pressures that can weigh on accused persons and also on the lack of uh, procedural safeguards surrounding trial waiver systems. Uh, one of the first uh, findings that I wanted to share with you and that has already been uh, shared by our partners is um, the total lack of data collection and research around trial waiver systems. And due to the context, uh, the efficiency-driven context in which they evolved, I, as it has been uh, highlighted by Jacqueline in the first panel, and due to the practical problems that they sometimes pose uh, for uh, accused persons and for their rights, as it has been exposed by uh, Alejandro in the first panel and by our uh, project partners in the second panel, we believe that trial waiver systems um, must be looked at more carefully. Oops. Okay, um, so we wanted to start again from uh, the conception of consent, um, which is a cornerstone, cornerstone for trial waiver systems in Europe. As it has been shown by Rebecca in the first panel, consent is central to uh, the European Court of Human Rights case law. It's also central to uh, domestic laws of our uh, domestic um, of the domestic laws of our uh, partners' countries. So um, as it has been studied in our research, um, before validating a trial waiver agreement, a plea, uh, a guilty plea, or a request for an abbreviated trial, judges in all countries studied 
must verify first that the person has understood the consequences of entering a trial waiver system. And second, they must verify the voluntariness of the accused person's consent to trial waiver systems. And trial waiver systems ex existence and justification actually relies on the following assumption that suspected and accused persons are empowered, they are assisted, and they have the means to make a voluntary and knowingly decision uh, as to uh, whether they will go to trial or uh, use trial waiver mechanisms. But as we have found through this research, uh, this idea that people are always empowered and to knowingly and informedly and voluntarily consent to trial waiver systems, in many cases, it is not a reality. After comparing the law and practice uh, from our five studied countries, we have identified two main findings in that regard. First, we have found that uh, the systemic failures of criminal justice systems sometimes create pressure on uh, people to waive their rights to a fair trial. And therefore, they are not in a position to voluntarily consent to trial waiver systems. And secondly, we have found that there is a lack of procedural safeguards surrounding trial waiver systems. People are sometimes not assisted by lawyers, Sometimes uh, access to information is insufficient, access to case file is also insufficient, and it makes it difficult uh, for persons to knowingly uh, consent to trial waiver systems. Uh, Rebecca's finding on the autonomy of accused persons in trial waiver systems has been echoed through our research. In many cases, uh, the person's decision to consent will not be determined by the strength of evidence against this person or uh, by their actual guilt or innocence, but by the fear of the consequences of going to trial. And we have identified uh, four pressure points um, that are pushing people to accept, um, to enter into trial waiver systems. The first uh, pressure point is the time and cost of proceedings as it has already been exposed by Rebecca. Uh, trial waiver system can become very appealing when the time and cost of going to trial is prohibitive compared to the time and cost of uh, entering a trial waiver system. And it's um, particularly problematic for uh, more vulnerable people who don't have the means um, to pay for a lawyer or pay for court's fees. Uh, and especially when uh, they also have to uh, pay other debts as uh, housing, food, uh, education, help or provide for their families. And uh, a transversal concern um, that we have seen throughout this research is the discrimination that can flow from the operation of trial waiver systems, which appears sometimes to amplify uh, the existing discriminations, for example, based on the social status or on financial means, as it has been already highlighted by our partners through their presentation, uh, most vulnerable groups sometimes uh, prefer to go to a trial waiver system uh, right, rather to pay um, for a lawyer or to pay uh, for the court's fees and sometimes do not understand the consequences of their choices, especially because they cannot afford a lawyer and are not um, sufficiently assisted. The second uh, pressure point is our conviction rates and high uh, sentencing policies. This has been highlighted already by Dorian in Albania, uh, where the very low acquittal rates uh, very often push uh, people to accept a trial waiver system because they know uh, they, win, they will not stand a high chance at trial to be acquitted, even if they are innocent. And uh, the general toughening of criminal sanction and the increased use of custodial sentences, as it has been highlighted by Jacqueline in the first panel, uh, are also part um, of this trend. The third one is pretrial detention. We know, uh, and people, a suspected and accused person know that when they choose the option of going to trial, it most probably means uh, spending months in pretrial detention, sometimes years. And uh, sometimes, and especially for more vulnerable defendants, uh, they would rather keep their job, their housing, the ability to provide for their family, and so choose to go uh, through a trial waiver system. Uh, so this is an even stronger incentive for people experiencing poverty but also for non-nationals who are more affected by, uh, by pre-trial detention, as it has been uh, already highlighted by uh, our um, partners. And I also, in terms of discrimination, the case of Fitchery, uh, Fitchery in the video we showed at the beginning of this webinar, uh, I think speaks for, in, for itself. And then the fourth pressure point is direct pressure, because uh, as it was exposed by Jacqueline, 
um, criminal justice actors are more and more intervention interventionist uh, towards the person's choice. And sometimes uh, prosecutors, judges, or the police uh, will be incentivized by the purported gains of trial service systems in terms of savings, savings, resource, and time, um, and will push suspected and accused person to waive their rights to, to trial. Uh, for example, in Cyprus, uh, it was reported that uh, accused person uh, often perceive from what has been said to them by the police, by prosecutors, by judges, but also by their own lawyers and sometimes by interpreters, that pleading guilty is their only option. And also in Slovenia, sometimes judges uh, actually encourage defendants to plead guilty uh, or go to the hallway with the prosecutor to uh, negotiate a solution and to reach an agreement. And the same was highlighted by Dorian um, in Albania with regard to uh, abbreviated trial. Another question we have asked ourselves through these studies, through this study is actually are accused persons uh, empowered to make an informed decision with regard to uh, going to trial or choosing a trial waiver system? And due to the lack of procedural safeguards that are applied in the context of trial waiver systems, we have seen that it's uh, very often hard for them to make an informed choice. We've seen that uh, access to case materials is often problematic in practice, as it has been highlighted by Dorian in Albania, sometimes lawyers have to uh, check the case file on the spot. Um, and it's very problematic, especially in a negotiation um, setting, because uh, accused person have to negotiate with the prosecutor and they are supposed to be uh, there are supposed to be a power balance between them but if the person has no access to case file it is very problematic uh, the same similar concerns have been raised um, with regard to the lack uh, of legal assistance assistance or insufficient legal assistance um, for example uh, for uh, many types of two uh, trial river systems there is no mandatory mandatory representation for seen in law um, Katarina has explained this with regard to the pretrial stage in Slovenia and told us that uh, in 48% of cases, people accused persons were not represented in the pretrial hearing stage where they plead guilty. Uh, there's also the problem of informal negotiations, uh, which are taking place more and more because it's more convenient um, to uh, pass by all the guarantees and the uh, and uh, the requirements to record the agreement, you have a lawyer present, uh, but uh, more and more uh, deals are negotiated in the hallway without the lawyer being present, which is very problematic also for vulnerable defendants uh, because they don't have a mean, don't have the means to afford a lawyer. Um, and it is even more the case as uh, there are insufficient legal aid systems, uh, which are designed in a way that does not empower uh, lawyers to. Um, provide an in-depth and quality assistance for uh, their clients. Uh, often remuneration is based on hearings, but not uh, on the negotiation process or the preparation of the case uh, pre-trial, um, which makes uh, lawyers incentivized to treat more and more cases, uh, but not in a qualitative way. There's also the problematic of the equality of arms, uh, which has been highlighted by Dorian in Albania extensively. And these problems are not really specific to trial waiver systems. Uh, they are general in the criminal proceedings, but they are very problematic in trial waiver systems because all the, the process uh, happens behind closed doors. And um, there is a shift towards an increased uh, prosecutorial power, which is based on the assumptions that prosecutors can actually control fairness in an impartial and independent manner, the same way as courts do. But um, in the current state of play, Efficiency considera consideration often um, enter in conflict with prosecutors' uh, normative role. And this is problematic in the context of trial waiver systems, because as we will see um, with this next slide, uh, trial waiver systems um, suffer from a real lack of effective remedies if procedural rights are breached. Um, so to trial, level syst trial waiver systems, as we have seen through our study, is not an adequate setting for procedural rights to be exposed, procedural rights violations to be exposed. And I will quote uh, Jacqueline, uh, who in the first panel said that the trial is the setting in which the evidence is tested 
A trial is the setting in which fairness is verified. But what happens if there is no trial? What happens to scrutiny of the pretrial uh, procedure stage? Um, for example, with regard to evidence, um, judges can only reject or accept uh, the plea, uh, the um, sentence bargaining agreement, but they cannot do anything else. They cannot say, oh, let's hold on, let's check this piece of evidence first. And as it has been reported, for example, in Albania, uh, judges, uh, the review that judges make of the agreement is always, uh, is sometimes limited and sometimes focus mainly on ensuring that the defendant has agreed to the trial waiver system, but not if there is a serious case against the defendant. Um, there are also no specific processes in places, judicial guidelines or specific criteria for judges to verify that the accused person has really consented to the trial waiver system. Uh, it has been highlighted in Hungary that sometimes judges only ask a yes or no question. Have you consented? But in such uh, a setting with such an interrog interrogation, it's not possible to see if the person has been pushed by uh, either indirect or direct pressure points. Um, and it's uh, very, di very difficult to verify that procedural rights have been actually respected. And as uh, Alejandro was also saying, in Spain, judges are not even incentivized to uh, actually in deeply check uh, the person's consent. Um, and even if there had been directly uh, direct pressure or coercion, this kind of violation do not always come uh, to broad daylight with trial waiver systems, because it's typically at the trial hearing stage that violations are raised by lawyers and brought to the attention of court. But without a proper trial, there is a huge risk that procedural violations are not uh, addressed. And we also fear that sometimes it's not even in the advantage of the accused person to raise violations because they know that if they do, the judge will just reject the agreement. But due to the context we just have, we have just exposed, uh, in many cases, accused person really want the uh, agreement to be passed. Um, and another problem, of course, is uh, that uh, in many trial waiver systems, people waive their right of appeal uh, with, together with other uh, full trial rights which prevents them uh, from complaining for other uh, procedural violations. Which brings me to our conclusion. Um, so as I said in the beginning, one of the biggest difficulties we, have, we had with this research, research, it's the lack of data available and the lack of research on trial waiver systems years after the implementation, which leaves many questions unanswered and many blind spots. As Emmanuel was explaining before, we are not even sure uh, that people are actually benefiting from lower sentences as prosecutors uh, are sometimes offering um, sentences that are really high compared to what the person would get uh, with a full trial. Um, the question of uh, the winding, the net winding effect of trial waiver systems uh, is also left unanswered. Um, this is why we think uh, that trial waiver system deserve uh, full attention uh, today. And especially when we see that um, in these systems, all the criminal justice actors, which are supposed to guarantee the fairness of the process, um, they are actually pushed by uh, efficiency considerations and less toward the guarantees of the rule of law, which leave accused persons quite uh, alone uh, facing those violations. Um, so, for tra so trial waiver systems should not be only analyzed uh, on efficiency angle, but they need to be understood as a human rights and a rule of law issue. And the starting point should be to identify their risks and shedding light uh, on their blind spots. And I will stop here and uh, give the floor back to Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Do I even need to conclude? Um, we were we passed the the time, um, so I'll just very briefly uh, conclude. Thank thank you all um, all panelists for uh, their participation. Um, first and second panel, I think this was a, a really really interesting morning, and I hope it was as interesting um, for all the attendees. As raised many times today, people plead guilty for a number of reasons that are entirely independent from the merits of the case, their innocence or guilt. Um, 
And I think we can all agree that the good functioning of the criminal justice system is in the interest of all actors, including suspects and accused persons. And it may be the case that trial waiver systems are beneficial um, for accused persons if they are entered into freely um, and voluntarily uh, and for the right reasons. And to in ensure that um, this has been highlighted several times, there is a need for stronger procedural rights guarantees, including the mandatory access to a lawyer. And there is a need for an effective judicial oversight of the process by which a person uh, reaches that kind of agreement. Um, but again, as raised many times today, procedural safeguards and judicial oversight are only elements of the solution, uh, and they cannot be used as an alibi uh, to legitimize trial waiver processes in all instances. Um, states must engage in a wider systemic reform uh, to ensure that criminal legal systems are used in a proportionate, in a pro in appropriate way. Uh, including by limiting the use of custodial sentences, limiting the use of pretrial detention, um, and decriminalizing and diverting cases out of the criminal justice system. There is, as Natalie raised, a clear need for data collection, research, and impact assessments of trial waiver systems, um, and a real inquiry into um, whether they have indeed met the, their objectives of cost efficiency, or whether, as suggested by Jacqueline, and this is clearly something that has been demonstrated uh, in the United States, whether instead they have expanded, extended the, the criminal justice net uh, by allowing to process more cases faster at a lesser cost and at the expense of fundamental rights, including by prosecuting cases that should never be uh, prosecuted in the first place. So. Um, we at Fair Trials will publish a report um, highlighting our findings and um, our recommendations um, for um, a fair uh, trial waiver systems. And we look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you in the, in the future. The webinar was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you again, all, um, all speakers. Um, and to all of you who attended the webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.